I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Anchorage Assembly and begin with a roll call. Mr. Clayman. Here. Ms. Gray Jackson. Honored to be here. Mr. Flynn. Well, Ms. Johnston. Here. Ms. Ostiander. Here. Ms. Drummond. Here. Mr. Birch. Here. Mr. Gutierrez. Here. Mr. Starr is excused. Dr. Selkraig. Here. Mr. Coffey. Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Mr. Clayman, will you lead us in the pledge? Thank you. We have a series of minutes, um, so motion would be in order. That old Maui, Maui. Um, you're going to have to be specific as to which minute on that motion, please. Microphone, please. <laughs> the minutes of June 16th, move to approve. Second. Um, I, I, just a moment, please. Right. I want to make sure I understood that. It's the minutes for June 9th that are also continued on the 16th and 17th? Yes, Madam Chair. Is that acceptable to the second? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. Is there objection to, or is there discussion? Is there objection? Madam Chair, I'd like to speak. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in reading these both sets of minutes um, tonight, um, I have to say I was disappointed to find that of all the hundreds of people that testified to us, on uh, AO 64, not a single one of them has a description of what they said. Uh, while minutes, the next minutes that we will be taking up for the special meeting of June 24th, there are at least two line descriptions for every person. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't see any reason why the public or any one of us should have to re-listen to 30 hours of testimony in order to find out what it was a specific person said. And I would respectfully request that at least three words be applied to each person's testimony for, against, and perhaps a single word on the subject of their testimony. That's, that's my comment. Well, I'll certainly confer with the clerk on that, but if anybody else has concerns about that issue, maybe you could talk to me after the meeting so we could uh, set direction for the clerk's office on what we expect in minutes mm -hmm. later on. Okay, thank you. Well, we're just in discussion now, Madam Clerk. All right, is there any other discussion? Is there objection to approval? Seeing none, the minutes are accepted as presented. The next set. Move to approve the special meeting of June 24th minutes. Second. Is Madam that, Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. I'd like to note that on the agenda, the, June, the meeting of June 24th was mistakenly listed as a regular meeting. That's item 4B. That is a special meeting, not a regular meeting, and I'd like to hereby correct the agenda if that's the way to do it. Okay. Well, at, at this point, my, my sense is that having the, excuse me, having the motion specifically say special meeting should be adequate. So if no one objects, we could just proceed that way. Point of order, Madam Chair. State your point. Well, there's two minutes there. Uh, at least I have copies of two, and I thought one was... Wasn't one a continued meeting? And I'm yes, yes, sir. We just approved the continuation yes. meeting. The 16th and 17th. The the meeting that started on the 9th went through the 16th and the 17th. We just approved that. Okay. The motion now is for the special meeting of June 24th. Ms. Drummond rightfully yes, pointed I, out that the agenda does calls it a regular instead of a special. I, but thank you. Since the motion is special, I think that's acceptable. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, is there objection to acceptance? Seeing none, those minutes are accepted as presented. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, do you have anything for us this evening? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, several things. Uh, a couple of announcements to make regarding uh, Diversity Month, which starts on September 1st. It kicks off with uh, a lunch at the Senior Center with uh, Danny Glover, renowned actor as the uh, uh, featured speaker. and. It will conclude on September 25th with the Mayor's Unity Dinner, and we've just confirmed that uh, NFL Hall of Famer Lynn Swan will be the uh, featured speaker at the uh, Unity Dinner. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we've got some outstanding 
uh, big names coming to uh, Diversity Month and to the Unity Dinner. So. And, and just to clarify, you meant the Anchorage Senior Center, didn't you? Did I say Anchorage? What did I say? You said just the Senior Center. Oh, oh. We have two, Mr. Mayor. Well, as, it was not the Chugach ones, or Chugach one, I'm sorry. Thank the, you. The, um, uh, other announcements, we uh, had a meeting today, and I'll let uh, George Vakela speak a little bit, but uh, it was a very important meeting regarding uh, preparedness for if we do have any um, energy disruptions and deliverability of service this winter like we've come close to over the last couple winters. And uh, George, would you mind just saying a couple words about that meeting? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Assembly Members. Uh, we had it, uh, everyone participated uh, from the utilities, the general managers, and they also brought staff. And the genesis of the meeting was uh, uh, several fold. Uh, one was uh, to at least get some agreement amongst the uh, key players as to uh, what the most likely um, emergency would be uh, this winter. Uh, what's the most likely situation that we may have to deal with? Uh, number two, to get buy-in from the uh, utilities, uh, all the utilities to include NSTAR, uh, as far as providing uh, an individual or two to assist us in uh, developing and flushing out a comprehensive plan to deal with the most likely scenario, uh, but also to deal with a scenario that would be uh, much worse uh, if there was a complete disruption for a long extended period of time, uh, because we have to do that as well. Uh, and then uh, to also uh, get buy-in uh, to a tabletop exercise to be held uh, in early November. And the date, uh, not later than, was established uh, for this. And so uh, part and parcel to that is uh, not only them buying into it, but also providing folks to help us to design a scenario that would uh, allow us to basically task and or tack uh, each one of the utilities in their uh, ability to be able to perform under a scenario that we develop. And they have agreed to that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they have been very helpful in coordinating amongst themselves to try to deal with an awful lot of these situations. And so there, there has been great coordination amongst uh, the four utilities, and the four specifically is MLMP, AWW, uh, I'm sorry, MLMP, NSTAR, uh, MEA, and Chugach Electric. And uh, so th that was very enlightening. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we all agreed that uh, the public at large, as well as businesses, play a big part in this. Because if, in fact, we do have a shortage of gas for one reason or another, uh, then all of us, uh, whether we're business owners or whether we're uh, private homeowners or renters, there's something that we can do and we can conserve. So we're coming up with an conservation plan uh, that will be uh, basically put out through the media uh, and whatever mechanism that uh, we feel in our plan is the best way to uh, educate. Uh, we'll also have an alert warning system that if, in fact, we receive notification that there is a possibility of a pressure shortage uh, for gas, uh, that uh, folks will be instructed uh, to basically implement uh, the conservation plan. And we'll probably be uh, uh, marketing that in October uh, so that we have a month in which to educate folks on proper methods of where we can get the biggest bang for a buck on conservation. And then we will actually do a drill in October uh, asking folks to go ahead and conserve, conserve. And as a result of that, we can measure how much of a savings we can anticipate if people participate. So that would be a good thing for the utilities to know so that they know not in, in addition to what they can do, but what in addition we could expect from the public to do to get us through uh, a situation. So that's where we are. And um, uh, like I say, all of the utilities were very cooperative. And I think that, uh, you know, we'll have a good plan. Thank you. We do have some questions. Go ahead, so um, First, I want to say thank you very much to the administration for taking this on right away. It's been a problem um, the Community and Economic Development Committee has been aware of for some time. And I'm really pleased to um, hear about the conservation piece. It's a smart approach. It seems to me that this is a three-legged stool. One is the utilities. Two, it's the public conservation. And three, it's a risk management plan. And um, what we actually asked to look at the risk management plan. And if you've had an opportunity to look at the risk management plan 
for, say, the worst scenario, which is that the utilities go down and, in fact, Anchorage is without electricity or without, um, uh, you know, power um, in the middle of the winter, and these things usually happen when it's 20 below, um, it would, it's my understanding, worst scenario is it could take as much as a week to bring us back or even a little bit longer. So the question is, is what does Anchorage do and for that week and how, you know, what are the critical, how, how the hospitals deal with it, how do people who are dependent on emergency um, supplies. And it looked to me like the plan in place was not adequate. I think they counted up the recreational vehicles in the city. And so anyway, I'm, look, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this and I would just encourage you to take that third um, piece and really put some time into that as well because hopefully we won't need it, but if we do, it'd be great to have a good plan in place. If I may, uh, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, like I said at the outset, there was two pieces to the plan that we're looking at. One is the most likely scenario. The second is the worst case great. scenario. We will have a plan that great. will address the most likely scenario and we will exercise that plan. We will also have a plan that will deal with the worst case scenario. Thank you. We just won't have the opportunity to exercise. We hope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. As the uh, designated assembly representative on energy issues, I attended it, and I just want to echo what uh, the city manager stated relative to the uh, obvious cooperative attitude expressed by all of the utilities. Um, MEA, Chugach, and MLNP, and NSTAR were all there recognizing very well the problems and offering uh, any assistance they could render to us to ensure that if the most likely scenario hits or the most or the worst scenario hits, we at least have some um, plans and concepts in place to deal with them as best we can. I mean, there's obviously ones that could overwhelm us, a major earthquake or something like that over which we have no control. But the uh, consensus was the most likely scenario is an equipment failure compressors in the field, and uh, that would be uh, an unlikely, uh, that would be an event that would not be anticipated to occur, uh, and if it happens at a time of, of very cold weather, I believe that by the time uh, the city manager and the utilities are done, uh, which will be uh, late this fall with their planning process, that we will be as prepared as we can be, and I will continue to participate with them and keep this body informed as we go along. And uh, I got a bunch of materials today. I didn't have an opportunity to copy them and stuff, but I'll make sure that they go to Barbara and they can be in your boxes and, and then people who are really interested in reading up and seeing what's happening can have that opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for doing that, Mr. Coffey. Ms. Drummond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my thanks as well to the administration. Um, as a member of the Title 21 Committee and uh, other members here, I know we had some very interesting discussions in that committee several weeks ago on the um, lighting section. Um, there are lots of energy saving uh, issues that will be addressed by the Title 21 revisions as they come into play and they will be um, uh, energy saving and, and uh, in, in that respect and that should help in the long term um, it won't help immediately. I'm, in fact, I'm not sure that we're going to have those sections passed by the time this winter's uh, critical energy use period happens. But um, for the long term, the energy savings will be there in our land use regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Mayor? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Police Chief Search Committee, a citizens committee that I appointed to help us in the search for a new police chief, met last week and uh, had an organizational meeting so they know the process that uh, that we want to undertake. Applications have been coming in. I think we have uh, a couple dozen already. And um, once the application process closes, they will uh, take a couple weeks and, and review and then make rec recommendations to the mayor, uh, probably two or three names at the most, that uh, we will then choose a final, uh, a final chief from. So I'm pleased that the citizens have stepped forward that are on the committee and look forward to, to their work. Uh, just another quick note. the. Um, we will be working uh, a work session this Friday with the Assembly on uh, uh, budget matters. Uh, Ms. Frasca will be, I think, presenting the revenue forecast. Is that the? Preliminary. Yeah, very preliminary revenue forecast, uh, she reminds me, because uh, uh, September is you know, months away from uh, when the, the year actually starts. So, but uh, we are required to give you that presentation. And, and then um, that same afternoon, I'll be handing out uh, the uh, Administration's Chronic Public Inebriate and Related Issues of Homelessness Strategic Action Plan. We've been working on this from uh, 
the, literally day one that we started this administration and recognizing that it's a big community problem out there and uh, it was important that we put together a, a good game plan that uh, really will yield results and so on Friday I'll be handing that out to assembly members as well and look forward to your review and comments on it. Mr. Clayman has a question. Uh, it wasn't so much a question but it was a request with regard to the budget matter. I know at some of the prior meetings with the budget committee as well as I think assembly meetings about budget there had been questions and I think your answer had been they were projections from the treasure state or the city treasurer. I would just ask that he be in attendance at that meeting as well so that if I have if we have questions about that he'll be available to answer. And then just finally a couple of things of uh, um, I guess more civic note uh, social note uh, was pleased to be able to participate in the uh, dedication of the Jewish Cultural Center and their uh, welcome to the to the mayor and the first lady on Sunday. On Saturday uh, Ms. Johnson and I had the pleasure of uh, dedicating a new trail at the top of Alaska. And, uh, we were at the trail and Ms. Johnson came down from the mountain above, uh, which she had climbed while we were busy uh, trying to dedicate a trail. So, um, but what was fun about it is there's this arch of balloons and, you know, 30 people um, celebrating the dedication of this trail. And a couple came up around the corner and thought that this welcoming was for them as they uh, came up the trail for the first time. So they thought, what a hospitable town. You come up a trail and they welcome you. So it was... Uh, that's pretty cute. Anyway, that's the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing I wanted to announce was the, the, that work session. If you want to attend, it will begin at 1 p.m. It will last about an hour, and it will be here at City Hall. It, I'm sorry. Ms. Gray Jackson, I didn't note that you were in queue. Did you want to make a comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to thank the mayor for making the homeless and inebriate plan a priority and the very few months that he's been in office. Thank you very much. And I have one question in regard to the the six police applicants. Are they all local or any from outside? Well, we've actually had a couple dozen applicants from all over. Thank you. Both in state and out of state. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Gray Jackson? I want to um, make some kind of alerts and forecasts on the agenda tonight for the benefit of those in the audience. There um, will probably be a delay in dealing with item 11B and 11C. Those are both relating to approval of labor contracts. This, this assembly authorized a contract with an outside attorney to do kind of an analysis of our process. That report um, is not in yet, but we are anticipating receiving it by our next meeting. So I was going to ask, I talked to Mr. Coffey about potentially delaying this until the end of September so that we have time to absorb that report and potentially react to it uh, through these ordinances. Um, there are also, if you're here on item 14A, this is relating to the Anchorage Ski Club and a, and a liquor license. This has been determined that it, we could, it could be handled administratively, so it will not be discussed this evening. Um, I think, I'm sorry, 13A, yes, it's AR28. And that's the only specifics on the agenda I'm aware of at this point. I'd like now to begin with committee reports. Um, starting down at your end, do you have anything to report, Mr. Clayman? No, ma'am. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation to Ms. Frascas because during the um, budget committee meeting, I had asked if the administration had any plans to bring forward a resolution dealing with the budget reductions. And um, she said that she would get back to me <clears throat> uh, and with an attorney's opinion. And, and she did that. I got an email this afternoon, so I want to thank you for that, Ms. Frascas. But with that said, um, I think it's very important to publicly express my opinion. And I do believe that the administration needs to bring forward um, a budget resolution revision for the assembly to deal with in terms of approval and in terms of giving the public an opportunity to speak. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I am going to quote one section of the charter that um, leads me to believe that this is absolutely the case. 
The section 1306 says if the mayor determines that revenues would be less than appropriations for a fiscal year, the mayor, mayor shall so report to the assembly. The assembly may reduce appropriations as it deems necessary. And during the 17 million plus budget shortfall that we had, uh, three of my colleagues agreed with me because they brought forward documents, um, AO 2934, that talked about amending appropriations to funds uh, for the updated general government operating budget. And also, uh, they brought forward another resolution for the assembly to deal with to re reduce appropriations. So um, I'm glad to see that my colleagues agree with what I believe needs to happen. And um, with that said, I hope that the administration does bring forward um, a resolution for us to deal with, even if they don't believe, based on legal opinions, that they need to. But I think it contributes greatly to the public process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Great Jackson, I don't think I've seen that that um, email that you got back. Could it be shared with everybody? I have not seen any legal opinion on uh, that. Certainly, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. In, on that specific point, yes. So, okay, go ahead. Um, it would be helpful if this Friday we reviewed just the protocols of how we're going to work together and, and what your anticipated process is, and maybe we could have a little discussion about, you know, how we can um, move forward with a sense of knowing what's going on and what kind of actions we need to take to ensure that, just so that we don't start out in a big cat fight at the beginning, um, you know. So, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm responding, uh, you know, because I think uh, uh, the mayor has sat in, on this body and he, I'm sure, Mr. Mayor, you understand the interest on our part um, in terms of the budget. And I'm sensitive to the issue that Ms. Gray Jackson's raised and it would be nice to sort through that um, together somehow so that we can figure out how to move forward together. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And, and to the administration, if you could just send copies of that legal to all assembly members, this will be an item of high interest to all of us. Uh, Madam so. Chair, it, it wasn't a legal opinion, written legal opinion. If oh. you look at the email, um, Ms. Fastjack just basically said that Mr. Wheeler agreed with, with her opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Well, then maybe a copy of this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and, and Madam Chair, I was in the queue. I'm sorry. Topic. I'm just trying to... On this point, and I didn't know, was there an administrative comment you wanted to make it before I recognize Mr. Clayman? Not yet? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Clayman, on the, this point. Uh, thank you. And I, I, and I, the email came about 1 o'clock this afternoon, which is probably why you hadn't seen it yet, Ms. Osiander. Anyway, uh, I had a separate question, and Mr. Wheeler, you may, not need to, you may need to do some research before responding, and I'm very comfortable if you need a little time. A couple of days is totally fine. Uh, the opinion that was asked was about reducing basically a department spending less than was appropriated, and did the assembly need to approve spending less than it was appropriated? There's a different question that's raised by a – there's a different question that's raised when revenues are projected to be – or there's a suggestion that revenues will be less than budgeted. So if we budgeted, just by way of example, $400 million as the budget, but now there's a there's a belief that the revenues will be less. Does the assembly need to have have some kind of a hearing and introduction to actually approve a reduced amount of revenue, which is a very different question than can a department choose to spend less than was budgeted? And uh, I don't think you should. I'm, you may be able to answer tonight, but if you need time to research it, that's fine too. But that's that's a follow-up question. Is not on the spending side, but on the revenue side. Okay. Through the um, chair. Did you want to respond to that, sir? Yes, thank you. Through Go the ahead. chair, Assemblymember Clayman, the provision that we looked at, as uh, Assemblymember Jackson, uh, Gray Jackson indicated, is Charter thir Section 1306, which requires the mayor to report if the revenues will be less than the appropriations for the fiscal year. There's no specific requirement that that report actually be a request for the Assembly to approve a change to budget based on lower revenues than originally predicted. So the report can be accomplished in any number of ways unless and until the assembly decides to codify some direction because the revenue changes could be anything from a dollar to millions of dollars. So um, there's no specific direction that you report on a certain date or in a certain form or when it hits a certain amount. So that my informal conversation with the OMB director was along those lines, and we communicated that through email to 
Assemblymember Jackson. I'm actually I'm in receipt of that email as well. Um, my follow-up question to that is: Would you anticipate, at least in terms of providing information, that that would be provided on the regular assembly agenda, or is it your view that if you just send an email to all assembly members, that's sufficient notice? Through the chair, Assemblymember Clayman, I don't know whether an email would would rise to the level of a report as anticipated by the charter. Uh, however, I believe through work sessions and through uh, mayor's reports and other vehicles, the administration to date has informed the assembly of changes in revenue. Can we anticipate a published report on revenue that will be coming in as an assembly information item at a minimum in one of the next, one of the next meetings? Through the chair, assembly member, I'll have to defer to um, the mayor or the OMB director on what, how they're going to report their next forecast of revenue. If I could interject, there, there are now four more people in the queue who want to talk about this. Since we have a full agenda, maybe a good suggestion would be if we sort of channeled our concerns to the administration so they could see everyone's concern and question and then give us a formal response back. And we do have the work session on Friday, uh, Madam Chair, so well, uh, we will continue at that time what has been our practice of informing the assembly at every step on what we're doing with budgets and with reductions, uh, both in writing and, um, and during reports. So we'll continue that practice. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor, but the concern that Ms. Gray Jackson brought up is a little bit different, and that is the assembly's role in reductions. And um, we don't, I think, have a common understanding or a clear understanding of what that is at this point. And that's what I think I've got five people in the queue about. And that's the point that Ms. Gray Jackson brought up. But I don't want to take the whole meeting right now to deal with it. So, you know, there's still four people in the queue, so I don't know if you're reacting against my suggestion or not. I know. Is that okay to do that way? Seeing no objection? I, All right. I don't, I, I'm certainly happy to communicate my concerns to the administration. I've, in the world of serial meetings and everything else, I, I'll do my best to communicate my concerns well, beyond what I've announced tonight. Yeah, it's a common concern, but I don't want us to individually go down and all list what our concerns were right now. But um, anything else, Mr. Clayman? Just a, floor? Okay, go no ahead. Uh, the next person, Mr. Coffey. Point, just a quick point. Why wouldn't we bring up those concerns at the work session on Friday and don't worry about serial communications and so on? That seems to make the most sense. We're going to be talking about all these issues then what you know and then what did we do last time when this situation when mr clayman was mayor we redid the budget so i mean it would seem to me that we've already been we've just been through this uh with regards to a deficit and we should have a fairly good idea of what we need to do relative to it and if we don't let's ask the questions on friday and all right well we certainly can calendar some time on the work session to talk about it my understanding of what Ms. gray jackson presented is that there's a different response being proposed than the one we went through last time. That's all. But we'll calendar it Friday so people can talk about it then. Thank you. Well, committee reports kind of got shifted around. Did you have anything else, Ms. Gray Jackson, on your committee report? Um, actually, it's not my committee. I'm just a member, but I thought it was appropriate to bring okay. this up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I mentioned in our previous meeting, uh, the Anchorage Convention Visitors Bureau is one of the many organizations that organized the uh, uh, South Central Alaska Tourism Summit last week. It followed one uh, that preceded it in Juneau, and we'll, be, uh, we'll have a subsequent meeting in Fairbanks. Um, it, just to, as a quick reminder, it looks like we'll have about 120,000 fewer cruise guests in South Central Alaska next year. Uh, back of the envelope effect that Ms. Frasca will probably discuss with us on Friday is about $400,000 in the municipal uh, general fund, $400,000 away from ACVB and $400,000 away from debt service on the Anchorage Convention and Visitors Bureau, or, uh, Anchorage Convention Center. So, good times. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Um, we did have a Budget and Finance Committee meeting, and actually I think out of that we discussed having an AIM as far as these changes, and I, I will have to say that <clears throat> when um, three of us did a resolution during the last round of budget cuts, it was because we differed in the acting mayor's uh, approach to the budget cuts, so we were we were presenting a different version. Um, 
Also, the Municipal League met out in Palmer the summer meeting and had the opportunity of addressing some concerns both with Governor Parnell and Senator Bagish. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Drummond? I don't have a committee report, Madam Chair, but if I could just um, let the public know that the Spinard Road Hill is going to close beginning Thursday, probably until freeze up. That project is underway. Um, there have been surveyors working on it. I have a report from the Community Council's office that a uh, police officer um, issued a speeding ticket to somebody going 55 miles an hour down the Spinard Road Hill in a 20 mile an hour that's been posted, 20 mile, mile an hour construction zone. So be aware, thousands of people use that road every day. Go down Minnesota Drive or Arctic Boulevard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Burke? See, I attended the uh, Anchorage uh, Chamber Board meeting last Friday morning. Had a great uh, presentation by Dave Harbour on uh, uh, Outer Continental Shelf oil development and uh, and uh, the importance of that to Alaska. It was a, a really good uh, synopsis of, of some of the issues facing uh, Alaska and the rest of the country and uh, OCS development. And then Neil Freed gave uh, an economic update for any of you that have had uh, an opportunity to listen to uh, one of Neil's uh, presentations. It's uh, very enlightening, and uh, uh, he always uh, has a, a good perspective on basically what's keeping the economy going. And I think uh, uh, you know we're we're fairly uh, you know we've got a, a lot of unique attributes here in Alaska, but uh, most of them relate to resource development and the importance of resource development. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. In the interest of brevity, Madam Chair, um, we'll just point out that the Public Safety Committee will next meet on September the 9th at City Hall. Thank you. What time, Mr. Gutierrez? Ms. Gray Jackson, remind me, please. Um, through the Chair, um, thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. It's at noon, and um, I also would like to say that the subject of that, that meeting is to talk about the um, oh, newly... and Public and Yes. And yes. I would, would, thank you. would invite the administration to attend. Thank you. Go ahead. The community and economic development meeting was canceled last week because all of our members were out of town um, and we're in the process of rescheduling it. Um, on that agenda, um, we'll be talking about um, adding a new work committee which would focus on revenues or municipal revenues and really look at other communities across the country and how they fund their uh, budgets and um, bring that fo information forward to the assembly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Also. Um, we've got the housing committee that's very close to being ready to roll out. I think we want to work and figure out how to brief the committee and also work with the administration and figure out how to bring the, these agenda items on that committee forward in a way that doesn't surprise them. So that's what's on our agenda. Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Title 21 committee continuing its uh, review of Chapter 7 residential design standards. We've changed our date and time of meeting. We now meet on Thursdays at 945 in the Permit Center in the same room that we've been meeting in forever. I'm sorry, Mr. Coffey, was it 915 or 945? You, I thought you said I 9. would love it to be 945. I oh, thought you my mistake. I was thinking that Miss Osiander needed to come in from far, far away, and I thought we had 945. That's 915, super. I am corrected. Oh, foo, all right. <laughs> See? Trying, trying to make your chairman a happy person. Anyway, 915, my mistake. We will continue to 1145. Hopefully we will be done with residential design standards uh, this week and move on to commercial. We are meeting every Thursday. We are skipping no Thursdays until we get done with Chapter 7. Thank you. Thank you very much. The addendum is before us. Move to approve. Um, and just to clarify, you're, you're moving the amended addendum? Yes, ma'am, the Thank amended addendum. Much. Thank you. Is there objection to that? I'm seeing I don't, have a, I don't have a copy of the amended addendum. All right, the, the amended addendum had the two resolutions on it. Oh, it doesn't say amended at the top. All right, I'm sorry, mine does. Oh, yes, it does. I apologize. Okay, that's fine. All right. Is there objection to including the amended addendum? Seeing none, that is incorporated. I'm going to read the items that we've incorporated. 
uh, under the Resolutions for Action 9A1, AR205. It's a resolution of the Assembly recognizing the Nanaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls fast pitch softball team for their outstanding 2009 season and their excellent participation in the Little League Softball World Series. Um, A2 is AR206. This is a resolution um, recognizing and honoring Linda Heim, for, Helm, Heim excuse me, for 20 years of service to the municipality and the citizens of Anchorage. Under new business, 9D6 AM480 is a request for approval of purchase order for paying invoices from Alaska Railroad Corporation not to exceed $82,436. Under 9D7, AM481, it's change order number 5 to purchase order number 271376 with the Nordic Ski Association to provide ski trail maintenance for the municipality of Anchorage, Eagle River Parks and Rec and Community Development. 9D8, there's AM482, this is an executive appointment of Lucinda Mahoney, a chief fiscal officer. Under informational reports, 9E4, uh, informational memorandum AIM 86, this is ju the July 2009 financial reports. Under items for introduction, item 9F7 will be AO106. This is an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code section 21.66.010 to correct textual errors retroactive to July 21st, 2009. Under um, continuing for introduction is 9F8, AR204. It's a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating $240,000 from the Chugiak area, Chugiak Fire Service Area fund balance to the Chugiak Fire Service Area operating budget as a contribution to the Chugiak Fire Service Area Capital Improvement Fund um, to purchase two emergency facility generators and a replacement command vehicle for the Chugach Volunteer Fire Department. Under not, and that's accompanied by uh, Assembly Memorandum 483. 9F9 is Assembly Memorandum AM484. This is a, a AWW Authority Board of Directors appointment of George Bacalis. <clears throat> the consent agenda is before us. Item, we need a motion. Move to approve. All right. The consent agenda with the incorporated indentum is before us. I'm going to see what people would like to pull at this time. Starting with you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on the addendum to the consent agenda, item 9A2. On the regular agenda, 9B1 and 9E1. Is that B? As That's it. Right? Thank you. That was a D echo. as in B, boy, B as in boy and E as in oh, echo. I'm sorry. I misheard you. B as in boy. All right. And the information uh, memorandum on IT. Got it. Dr. Silkrig? Um, on the regular agenda, 9F4. All right. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez? Thank you, Madam Chair. On the agenda, 9 alpha 1. Oh. And on the regular agenda, 9 Bravo 3, for purposes of declaring a conflict. Okay. Mr. Birch? I believe the item I was looking at has been pulled. Thank you. No items. Ms. Drummond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, item 9, Delta 1, um, for a correction. All right. Item 9, Frank 6, again for a correction. Okay. I believe that's it. All right. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank it. you. Ms. Johnson? No items. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the addendum, item 9, Delta 6, to declare a potential conflict of interest. Okay. Anything else? Ms. Gray Jackson. No, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Clayman. No items. Thank you. All right. I'll read them to make sure. 
Oh, I'm sorry. The administration, do you have any to pull? All right. Here's what I have. On the addendum 9 alpha 1 and 2, on the regular agenda 9 bravo 1 and 3, on, on, on the uh, delta, on the regular agenda um, 1 and then 6 on the addendum. Under informational reports, the first one was pulled, E1. And then under the F section for introduction, um, number four and number six. Yep. Did I miss anything? No. All right. Is there objection to approval of the rest of the consent agenda? Seeing no objection, the rest of the consent agenda is approved unanimously. And I'm looking, I don't think there were any appointments there. Were there? I don't think so. Actually, there's two that were yeah. pulled. There were two but they were, were pulled, pulled yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. What? Oh, the chief fiscal officer. Where's the... I'd like then to... Um, I guess say an official welcome and thank you, Ms. Mahoney, for our, being our new Chief Fiscal Officer. It's good to have you, and we look forward to getting to know you better. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're pleased to have her on board. Excellent. All right. The first item before us then, um, Ms. Gutierrez? Move to approve. Um, is there objection to approving this resolution? Seeing none, we have a, it was approved. Is there a representative of the uh, 11 and 12 year old girls team that would like to come forward or do you want, we should have the whole team. Come on up. Come on down. If you could come up in front here of this little table, then the television camera could get your picture. And, then, and if anyone wants to take pictures, feel free to come up to the front if you want to get them from the front. <clears throat> okay, wait a minute. I just got technical advice here from Ms. Drummond. If you could stand behind the microphone for the resolution and then afterwards for pictures, you could come in front. <laughs> Madam Chair, this is a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing the Nunaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls fast pitch softball team for their outstanding 2009 season and their excellent participation in the Little League Softball World Series. Whereas the Nunaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls fast pitch softball team won the 2009 Western Regional Tournament in Vancouver, Washington, and whereas the girls fast pitch softball team outscored their opponents 32 to eight, finishing the Western Regional Tournament with six wins and zero losses, and whereas Nunaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls fast pitch softball team represented the Western Regional in the Little League Softball World Series. And whereas this uh, Nunaka Valley team is the youngest team on record from Alaska to participate at the Little League Softball World Series, whereas the girls' fast pitch softball team scored 20 runs in their five games, played against teams from the United States and many countries around the world, placing eighth out of ten teams in the Little League Softball World Series. Whereas the team has enjoyed strong and continued community support from the Nunaka Valley Little League Association, team sponsors, volunteers, managers, coaches, and parents who dedicated their time and resources to assist, accompany, train, and mentor the team. Whereas the Nunaka Valley Little League has recently celebrated its 50th anniversary and has enjoyed a long and proud history of offering valuable, healthy youth activities to many thousands of children living in East Anchorage. And whereas the community of Anchorage is proud of the Nunaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls fast pitch softball team for their participation in the 2009 Western Regional Tournament and Little League Softball World Series. Whereas Anchorage residents value the hard work and excellent accomplishments of the Nunaka Valley Little League players, J.C. Agafa, Heather Breslin, Kayla Emerson, Noya Fiami, Aaron Goudreau, Morgan Hill, 
Julia Merritt, Gabby Meyerson, Taria Page, Hannah Peterson, Sydney Smith, Lauren Syrup, and Mara Winningham, along with their manager Richard Knowles and coaches Richard Hill, Rick Peterson, and Chuck Thompson. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Anchorage Municipal Assembly is pleased to recognize the excellent excellence of Nunaka Valley Little League 11 and 12 year old girls softball team and commend them for their hard work and outstanding 2009 season. Bravo. Congratulations, girls. Girls, you want to come up front for pictures? You want to come right up here for pictures? Come up, yeah. Line up there real quick. Line up. Line up. Line up. Like they were giving out money. Oh, yeah. You guys get your you're job taken. You're shopping the mayor. That might help you. Yeah. Get the mayor in there. Yeah. Can I speak here? Wait for Mr. Gutierrez. Oh, I guess I want the coach. Open it up. Open it up. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Five. <laughs> right here. That is so good. The fact that you're going to have to get dirty enough on the picture. Smile, Kayla. I'll make coffee and give it to everybody. Go ahead, Dr. Stoker. Chair, I just want to—I just want to tell you that for me personally, this is a wonderful thing because, as a child, I played on these same fields. And it was girls softball, and it was a it was a great thing supported by the community. I will note that our fields could be improved a bit, and um, I know we're tight for money, but it is such a wonderful um, asset in the Nack Valley and for the east side of town. Um, and there's so much volunteer time that goes into a successful team. I think that as a community, we want to do everything we can to support Little League, and um, I'm certainly going to work hard to support the Nack Valley. I know Mr. Gutierrez and the, the assembly will be thoughtful in those same ways. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Clayman? There's a number of comments if you want to just hold a minute. Can you wait just a second? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Clayman. I, I noticed as, uh, first I want to congratulate all the players first and the coaches second because all, anyone who's coached will tell you that the players are the ones that make it happen. We just try our best to help you along, those of us coaches. Uh, but I noticed there's only one certificate with the seal on it that recognizes this city's support. And so what I would say to, and I'm sure that if any of the families want a, want a certificate for each individual player that reflects what we just did, um, please let Mr. Gutierrez, Dr. Selkraig, or, or the clerk's office know, and we will, we will sign some more certificates so that if, if families want an individual certificate for their child, let us know. We'll be happy to do it in the world of conserving paper. If you're, if you're, if you're like my house, we, they end up never doing anything with them. You don't need to request it, but if you do request, we will make sure that every child has a certificate if they want one. Thank That's you. all. Thank you again. Mr. Gutierrez? Thank you. You don't, you don't need to worry about requesting it. Dr. Selkraig and I had already planned that, so we'll make sure that everyone gets a certificate. I, uh, I, the, the, the single most enjoyable thing that I've had the pleasure of doing as an elected official was this spring throwing out the first pitch at the Nunaka Valley Little League. And to see, you know, how far everyone went, we have one of the best little leagues in the country right here, and it is an honor, it is a privilege. We are so proud of all the work you girls did. This doesn't come easy. It didn't just happen, right? You didn't just wake up and say, oh, we're going to the Little League World Series. It was a lot of work, and you did it, and you deserve our gratitude, our thanks. We're very proud of you. Well done. Coaches, well done. Parents, well done. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Did you want to make a comment, sir? I just, I just wanted to put it in perspective a little bit. Uh, someone at the World Series put it in perspective for me that there's 440,000 girls this age playing softball around the world. And there's only 130 went to the World Series. So these girls in the top 100 in the world 
softball players at this age level. And we had the youngest team there. We had six 11-year-olds on this team. And we had 13 girls. Most teams come with 9 or 10 or 11 girls. There was only two teams there with 13. We had the youngest with six 11-year-olds. So it's quite an accomplishment for these girls to, to be recognized as top 100 in the world at what they do. And our catcher got voted. Uh, we had Every team had to put a catcher in competition. Our catcher got number one in the world wow. for accuracy throwing. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Um, I'm going to just pause a second here. <laughs> All right, the next item before us, Mr. Coffey. 9A2, move to approve. Second. Is there objection? Seeing none, that item is approved. And uh, Linda, could you come down front, please? Thank you. Go ahead. This is a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly and Mayor Dan Sullivan recognizing and honoring Linda L. Heim for 20 years of service to the municipality and the citizens of Anchorage. Whereas Linda L. Heim was hired by the Municipal Clerk's Office on March 20, 1989, ending a career as school church and Special Olympics volunteer, chauffeur, bowling enthusiast, and seasonal election worker in the clerk's office, and whereas she became the business licensing clerk in 1990 and spent two years dealing with alcohol establishments, pawnbrokers, and massage therapists, and whereas that took some work, whereas in 1991 she became the board of equalization clerk and thoroughly enjoyed calming angry property owners and managing the affairs of the board. See, it's, things are getting better. <laughs> Whereas in 2000, she was promoted to her first love as elections coordinator, during which time she successfully administers three regular municipal, municipal elections, two special elections, and three runoff elections. And whereas in 2002, not wishing to become stagnant, stagnant, she accepted the position of deputy municipal clerk. And whereas on January 1st, 2003, she became the acting municipal clerk, during which time she and a new election coordinator competently conducted a mayoral election followed by a challenging recount, and whereas on June 5, 2003, she once again became the deputy municipal clerk with the responsibility to assist the new clerk and new election coordinator and to staff the newly created Board of Adjustment and the Board of Ethics during the rewrite of the Code of Ethics. And whereas life is short and there are many <laughs> exciting opportunities and adventures to experience while body and mind are still able, and whereas Linda L. Heim announces her retirement effective September 11, 2009, from service to the municipality of Anchorage and her commitment to enjoy life more, spend more quality time with family and friends, contribute more service to her church, and to accomplish her goals to write a children's book, become a more proficient piano player, organize boxes of photographs, and read all the books she's ever wanted to read. There's no time left. And whereas Linda's skills, knowledge, and dedication will be missed by the Anchorage residents, the assembly, the administration, and her co-workers, now therefore be it resolved, the Anchorage Municipal Assembly and Mayor Dan Sullivan recognizes and honors Linda L. Heim for her 20 years of service to the municipality of Anchorage and the citizens of Anchorage. Passed and approved this date. Congratulations. I was going to try to sneak out before this, but <laughs> after 20 years, I just have to say thank you. I don't know where 20 years has gone because it's really been a pleasure. I've enjoyed working with even angry property owners because <laughs> I felt I, in some way, was, it, it feels good to be a good public servant. And I've enjoyed working with many assembly members and a number of clerks. You know, one of my regrets as I was sitting here was, was thinking that I'm not going to be working with Dennis Wheeler because he was so wonderful during this recount election, and so I'll, I'll miss that opportunity, Dennis. But as you see, there's a lot more to life, and I'm ready to enjoy more of it. So thank you so much for the privilege. Linda, don't leave. Now we have a number of people who want to make comments to you. 
Ms. Gutierrez? Actually, I believe the mayor is standing by. Oh, all right. We'll let the mayor talk. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. We're going to miss you. <laughs> you know, I served with Linda for nine years, and I just want to say publicly, I don't think I've ever met anybody who was more professional and kinder in the implementation of her duties than Linda Heim, and uh, you will be missed, Linda. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Along the lines of, of what Mayor Sullivan just said, thank you for always having a warm smile, a kind and sincere greeting, both as a coworker and as an assembly member. And I hope you enjoy your retirement to the fullest because it is richly deserved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. That's so great. Well, it is interesting. Um, I, before the, the mayor was up, I already had the word kind. Um, and I would say that over the years, I can't think of a public employee that has been more kind or also more dependable. And so you're just totally competent. So it's going to be hard to fill your shoes. I want to say thank you for your service. It's been a delight to work with you. Thank you. Mr. Clayman. Thank you. The, the first I want to note that it really is a sign that, is, that it really was time for you to go on to more interesting things because I understand your letter of resignation had the appearance of an assembly ordinance. <laughs> yes, it did. And, and anyone who has now perfected the art of writing assembly ordinances and resolutions as a way of submitting your resignation means you need to be writing children's books and hopefully not following AO format. <laughs> So congratulations on great service. I know in my, both while I've been on the assembly and particularly during my work as chair of this body, you were always an incredibly reliable resource and uh, you will be missed, but it sounds like the plans you have for the future, you will not be idle by any no, stretch of the imagination. Sure. So have a great time. Thank you. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. On behalf of the Department of Law, I would like to thank Linda for training so many of us attorneys uh, to be better public servants, to be able to find the things that we needed to find so we could turn uh, her advice and her, her uh, good research into our work product. Um, she deserves a lot of credit for keeping the Department of Law on task uh, on short order, especially minutes before assembly meetings when we needed to find critical documents and she knew how and where to find them. Um, and in addition, on a personal note, uh, it was a hoot doing the uh, recount, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. Um, through a very stressful and difficult situation, she was all, all grace and all fun, and, and uh, I will remember that uh, in many ways fondly because of Linda's participation. And I, I do, I thank you very much. It was, it was, it was great to work with you those years. Uh, thank you. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Linda, you and I have worked together at one level or another for, for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised when I saw that you were retiring. Surprised because you're going to be missed, your, your knowledge and your expertise. Um, but also happy for you, and, and I wish you well, and I hope you enjoy the, the rest of your life and do the things that you want to do that make you happy and, and forget about us. Thank you. Oh, no, I <laughs> Mr. Flynn. Well, I want to apologize because the first email that came out said you were uh, resigning effective August 11th. And when I opened my big mouth, they got extended to September 11th. So sorry for costing you an extra one month's worth of work. And <laughs> hopefully, hopefully retirement still comes soon enough. Ms. Grinstein. Well, on behalf of the whole staff and myself in particular, I'd like to thank Linda for the six years that I've been here and all the 14 years before that. She's a consummate professional. She knows her job. She knows everybody else's job, and she does a great job, and you'll be missed. Thank you. I'll chime in at the end here. Linda, I want to echo the comments about your professionalism. The, one of the things that I've most appreciated is the fact that you are knowledgeable across a broad spectrum of areas. It, it isn't that you specialize in one area. You know something about everything. And I want to give you a, a warning to those of you who warned her to, to forget this place. I'm already trying to recruit her to potentially come back under short-term contract. So um, I hope we see her again. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. The next item before us would be um, Mr. Coffey. Move to approve item 9B1. Madam Chair, um, I was uh, 
approached several weeks ago concerning this matter. Uh, I see that uh, Ms. Andrews is here, and um, this is somewhat um, convoluted in that it involves many of uh, the city and private sector and the Urban League and others, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to just get, make a brief remark to us and to make sure that any questions that any of us might have relative to what we're proposing here can be answered by her. So if, with the chair's permission, if Eleanor could come forward and do that for us. I am just absolutely thrilled to be here tonight. I've appeared before this assembly since the date of unification on many issues, but this is something new. Uh, since I retired from active business, I got involved with the Urban League, the new affiliate here. And the whole thing about the Urban League is economic empowerment, empowering people, changing lives. So as a not-for-profit, we're doing something new. We're going to be working with young people to keep them from falling into the abyss of homelessness, a life of crime. We're going to help them complete their lives as juveniles and move productively into adulthood. We're going to have a horticulture, <laughs> hydroponic, energy efficient, using waste steam from the municipal generation plant and having real professionals work with young people to help deal with their psychosocial issues, complete their education, and learn the skills towards independent living. And this could not have happened without Dr. Mike Sobosinski, who brought this idea to the Urban League, Mike, <laughs> and the funding and support of Jeff Jesse with the Anchorage, I mean the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. This is truly a broad range collaboration. We've got private sector, public sector, individuals. This is a model of social enterprise that we're hoping will be something that we can use to generate other activities in the community and across the state. Not for profits doesn't mean you don't need to make money. You need to make some money to sustain what you do, and we hope that through our growing operation and providing local green produce year-round, it'll be something that will help the entire community and these kids. And so I'm just really glad there's so much support for it, and we should be in the ground next summer and maybe growing uh, hothouse things by September. Thank you. So there if you have any there questions. are some questions. <laughs> That's okay. Well, first, I'd like to be added as a sponsor. Um, and actually, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to speak to my appreciation that this team has come together to do this. And, you know, I think at a statewide level and also at a local level, there's this genuine concern about our children. And there are so many kids of this age that are so vulnerable. So there's examples elsewhere where things like this really worked. And I just wanted to say, here, here, this is great. And I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank um, Ms. Andrews for, for bringing this uh, forward. And I also want to thank Mr. Coffey for bringing it to um, this body. And I would definitely be honored to be added as a co-sponsor on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Birch. I just uh, was very intrigued by this, uh, Eleanor. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing this forward. One, one question, mm -hmm. is there a potential for the, the Muni spends a whole lot of money on flowers. Is there a chance for this to kind of graduate into something where they're, they're doing more than, than? Far be it from me to tread into municipal <laughs> government. <laughs> but you know, a greenhouse is a greenhouse. And I'm, I had heard before we had our fiscal crisis that the municipal greenhouse was going to be put in the same location. It certainly would be compatible. Whatever steam piping had to happen could happen to places that are adjacent to each other. But I, you know, I think it's a great idea as a citizen, but I'm yeah. not driving that bus. Yeah. It, it, is, it is a year-round operation? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for me, when I first met with Eleanor about this, I thought, now this is an ideal kind of thing for government to be doing. We have assets that we can put to use at virtually no cost to us. We can use our public utility in the form of MLNP uh, to donate, as you would, some, both some land and some product that will enable this to move forward. 
we have the uh, benefit, I understand, of, uh, of commitments of funding from sources other than the municipality, which is strapped at the moment, as we all know. And it hopefully will actually lower the cost of government over time because we will have trained, productive, and working citizens as opposed to uh, gangs and, and things that cost us nothing but money and create nothing but problems for our city. So I am, was very pleased to be able to do this, and I sure thank you and all those who have worked with you for bringing it to me and to us so that we can help further this, I think, very good project. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Dr you. Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for bringing this forward. This is just wonderful. I had the opportunity to chat with um, Mr. Posey of MLNP for a few minutes before the meeting began, and uh, I'm also very excited about the possibilities for the municipal greenhouse. I think it's great, and uh, please sign me up as a sponsor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When we're finished, I'll invite you all for salad. Sounds <laughs> And a tour. All right. Is there any further discussion on this point? Is there objection to approval? Seeing none, this item is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item before us would be 9B3. Mr. Gutierrez? Move to approve. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I need to declare a, a conflict. This is one of those appropriations from the Mountain View Weed and Seed Program. Uh, of which I am the site coordinator, and as we've discussed several times when these have come before us, that I've been told in no uncertain terms by the Department of Justice that I may not participate. Okay. I think that's pretty clear, and I'm not even going to ask the questions. I'm just going to rule that, yes, you do have a conflict, sir, and you should not participate in this discussion. All right. This matter is before us. Is there a discussion? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Birch, I didn't see you. Go ahead. One of the uh, things I was looking at on, on the expenditure side f for this uh, in, in, in using sworn officer overtime is the overtime allocation for expenditures is around $25,000 and the benefits are around 6000 I guess a question, it, it, did not, uh, it did not find, that was not aligned, if you will, with another ordinance that we have before us this evening. Uh, 9F4, where there's a different ratio between the overtime. And I, I'm just trying to get an understanding of how we compile the the uh, expenditure summary. And it seems to me like the benefit to overtime would be proportional in both cases. I, I'm just trying to understand maybe through the administration where the... Mr. Mayor, who would you the, like to have respond to that? Madam Chair? Yes, yeah. sir. We'll get back to Mr. Birch with a response on that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, just, it's, it, it's around 25% here, and then I think the other one, it's, it's more than that. And, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to approval? Seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. And if someone could ask Mr. Gutierrez to return, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. The next item before us um, would be 9 Delta 1. Ms. Drummond. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, move to approve. Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. Thank you. This is um, merely a correction, a spelling correction in the name of the person that is being replaced by the appointee, Adam Trombley. The um, original memorandum said Don Dickinson on line 10, and the person's name is actually Dan Dickinson. Is there any objection to that correction? Seeing none, that matter is corrected and approved. Oh, well, let me ask. Is there objection to approval of the corrected version? Seeing none, then um, this matter is approved as corrected. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Trombley is in the audience. I'd like to oh, recognize Mr. Trombley, him. Oh, Trombley, you come down and member? introduce yourself to us, please? <laughs> My name is Adam Trombley. just want to say thanks for the opportunity to be on the board, and I look forward to uh, learning all I can about how the city operates in the budget. Well, thank you again to the mayor. Thank you for your service. This is a real critical one, and yes. so we appreciate you putting the time and the 
and the independent eyes in it, on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item before us then is uh, Delta 6. And I'm not going to call Mr. Flynn since he has something else, but I need a motion. Move to approve. All right. That matter is before us. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this happens to be an arrangement with my employer. And uh, while I don't work in the real estate department, the, all the revenue goes to the same big bucket, and that's how they pay my salary. All right. It seems to me that there is a financial interest then. And so uh, I'm going to, without asking all the questions, just rule that Mr. Flynn has a conflict and should not participate. So I'd like it then, while he, after he leaves the room, and he's gone now, to ask if there's any discussion on this matter. Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to approval of this, mat of this matter? No, ma'am. Seeing no objection, the matter is approved unanimously. And could somebody ask Mr. Flynn to come back, please? That was a quick one. All right. We should just issue earplugs. Just issue earplugs. It's a suggestion from the vice chair. <laughs> All right. Um, the next item before us is uh, informational report 91. Mr. Coffey. Uh, move to accept. Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when you and I met over the weekend, you asked that I pull this relative to the uh, internal audit report which we received. I met today with the uh, new uh, chief fiscal officer, and we discussed uh, the concerns that were voiced by both the auditor and by yourself relative to um, emergency planning, I think might be the shorthand way of saying it. And my understanding uh, is that the uh, fix for that is well underway and the Chief Financial Officer is here to address that to the degree that anyone wishes to have further information. Well, I would appreciate just a brief summary of what the fix will be, if somebody could speak to that. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Michaelis, you're in queue. I apologize. I didn't catch it quick enough. Good, George. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the, the fix, basically, is to go ahead and do the plan. Uh, they are working with the Office of Emergency Management, um, and we are also looking at all the departments because we should have a continuity, a continuity uh, plan in place for all departments, not just IT. So we're looking at it, and we're doing a comprehensive uh, plan for all of the departments. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you addressing this. It caused me some concern to read that we didn't have a, necessarily a way to meet payroll if there was a problem. But I'm glad that it's being addressed. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on this matter? I just go ahead, Ms. Craig. I just want to um, first of all say thank you again to the administration. I think that the risk management issue is an issue that a lot of time get, gets overlooked. And um, my sense is that we've been busy doing a lot of things in this town, but we haven't spent much time really on these plans. So I'm looking forward to this work uh, across the board. And I think revisiting all those risk management plans over time is going to really pay off if we ever have a problem. So thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, is there objection to acceptance? No, ma'am. Seeing no objection, that matter is accepted. Thank you. We're now in uh, items for introduction, and I see that Dr. Selkraig, you pulled F4? Yes. Um, I recognize this is just for introduction, but I... Could um, you make a motion? Oh, a move to approve. Thank you. Uh, introduce? Introduce. Move to introduce. Thank you. All right. That matter is introduced. Would you like to make a comment? Um, this, this money is um, to address uh, issues that we certainly have in this town in terms of uh, juvenile justice. And as you read it, you, you find out that we actually um, can underwrite projects to prevent and control crime based on local needs and conditions. Um, I've attended several community meetings, one of them sponsored by AFAC with several hundred people in the room, all of which focused on graffiti and the problem of graffiti as it relates to the increase of, of um, gangs and crime and I'm just you know when I looked at this I, I've, I've been whining at this pulpit for a while about the amount of money we spend on um, software 
And, um, you know, once again, we've got a mobile data computer in, uh, infrastructure system rehabilitation project number one, and that's $2 million, and we were unable to find $35,000 for Graffiti Buster. And so I guess I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I think the payoff for the dealing with the graffiti may be very high if you look at other places. And I think when the, when our mayor spoke to the mayor of New York, he talked about doing that stuff up front that you can see. So, um, I don't know if this can be revised or the goals of this could be revised or if we have any control at all over where this money is going to go or if we're totally committed. But if between now and the next meeting we can eke out $35,000 to um, make that gritty, graffiti buster job full time, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing nothing further, that matter is um, introduced with a public hearing date. I'm, and we should have mentioned that in the introduction of the, our next meeting on the 15th of September. Is that acceptable to everybody? All right. The next item before us then um, would be 9F6. Ms. Drummond? Move to approve. Introduce. A move to introduce, excuse me. Need a third? We do need a third. Thank you. Thank Go you. ahead, Ms. Drummond. This, once again, is merely a revision or a correction. Yeah, merely a correction to um, the name of the person who is being replaced by the appointee, Mr. Sawhill. Um, the name of the person who is being replaced is Jill Kowalski. You have it in an amended um, memorandum in front of you who resigned and whose term expires in 2010. So she resigned uh, prematurely and Mr. Sawhill is being appointed and uh, this will be up for public hearing on the 15th? The 15th, is that correct? right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just that helps clarify which item will be before us then. Madam Chair, Mr. Sawhill is here. Do we want to recognize him now? Or? Well, it's, it's a little premature since we're just introducing him, but thank him. <laughs> okay. And hopefully this will be approved at our next meeting. We're required to have a public comment period. So thank you, Mr. Sawhill. We appreciate your being willing to do this and look forward to approving you next meeting. Ma Madam Chair, I, I just... I'm sorry. I, Mr. Mr. Sarr could at least wave so we know who he is. We okay. can put a face to the name. All right. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> and since he's here, maybe he doesn't have to come next time. I mean, but I would like to note that I think we're lucky to get expertise at this level on this committee, and I'm appreciative that he's willing to serve. I would echo that. I have had experience with comments from him in the past. They've been valuable. All right. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Did, did we advise Mr. Sawhill that he has to attend every Title 21 committee meeting for the I, rest of his I life? I think we should. Don't you, Mr. Coffey? <laughs> okay. Well, that occasioned a little more comment than I expected, Mr. Sawhill. All right. All right. The next item then before us, we're, that is the, that concludes our consent agenda. And we're moving now into the old business section of our agenda. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Mr. I would Flint. note that we have an appearance request on our agenda, and there, that must begin by 6.30 p.m. Oh, thank you, sir. I didn't ha note that. Let's then take our appearance request. I didn't think and um, is Teresa Lundy available? Would you come forward, please? Sunday, if you just start with your name and I'll have three minutes to speak. So go ahead. Oh, you better pull the mic down. Okay. Oh, and you have printed? Pardon? You asked for something printed? Yes. Well, okay. Okay, she'll pass it out and she'll copy it. So go ahead. Madam Chair, Assembly and Mayor, my name is uh, Teresa Lundy. I'm an Alaska resident for 30 years. I was relieved to hear that uh, from the mayor that the discussion will be made uh, regarding the homeless situation. <clears throat> I'm here on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves, my homeless friends in this community of Anchorage. There is an ancient Jewish proverb that goes like this, don't rob the poor just because you can or exploit the needy in court. I'm strongly concerned and dismayed in the way the assembly made decisions in haste 
passing an ordinance in July of this year making it illegal to camp in the woods, which is city property. This directly affected the homeless poor, the point of the ordinance. <coughs> Here was a wonderful opportunity for us to be a prototype or standard to the other cities of Alaska, the cities of Northwest and beyond on how to care for the poorest of the poor in our communities. Instead, you approved and gave legal permission for law enforcement to destroy the camps, the only shelter many of these people had. Did you notice it started raining a couple days after you set this into motion? Where do you suppose these people could go with their pitiful plastic bags of wet belongings? Not all the homeless are alcoholics or addicts. They are kids fleeing abusive situations at home. They're village residents looking for work that has gone sour. Many are people like you and I who have lost jobs, their homes, and, or families. The events of their normal way of living suddenly unraveling before their eyes. Don't fool yourself into thinking this cannot happen to you. It can. Some of you may just be one or two paychecks away from the situation yourself. Have you personally talked with families on the streets desperate to get out of the wind in January? Or have you talked to the mothers living with children in cars? As winter approaches, your apparent indifference is remarkable. Perhaps the assembly could take an intentional look at the many vacant buildings in the city. This might provide a way to help renovate a closed hotel that is sitting empty. Let the people who manage the Brother Francis shelter or the Covenant House administrate these new shelters. It would promote the economy by keeping the property owners of these buildings from going bankrupt. The city could bestow seed money to financially get the ball in motion. There's always a solution. Trying to pretend these people do not exist or are unworthy of our attention brings dishonor to the people of Anchorage. I was in an acute position of becoming homeless myself in 19 below zero weather. Uh, this past winter. I cannot adequately describe the fear, the shame, and desperation that I experienced on the verge of going into the streets with nothing. Could I survive outside? Could you? I think not. I am the face that could represent your family, a friend, a relative, perhaps yourself alone. Do I expect you to have... I'm sorry. Madam Chair, I'd like I'd add a question. Okay, well, there's actually three people oh, in good. queue. That's right, I just wanted to make... Hold on. Mm -hmm. Did you want to finish your sentence? Yes, if I may. Go ahead. Do I expect you to have all the answers? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Gray Jackson. All right. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. Thank you. Ms. Lundy, I want to thank you. I'm over here um, for coming out uh, this evening and what you had to say. It was very, very powerful. And um, I remind myself every single day, no matter what my situation is, Today, tomorrow can be drastically yes. different. I realize that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also want to let you know that, I don't know if you were here earlier, but um, Mr. Gutierrez, who's chair of the Public Safety Committee, um, there's going to be a meeting September 9th, and the only subject on that agenda is to talk about that ordinance. Is Thank that you. open to the public? Oh, absolutely. Okay. It'll be um, on the 9th at noon, City Hall, room 155. Thank you. You're welcome. That's so great. Did you want to finish finish your testimony? Did you have more to say? Did you, did you get just a little bit? Thank you. Would okay. you go ahead? I, I was wondering what else you had to and say. And you oh. will get a written copy of her. Comment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Do you want to finish? Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, however, if you allow the people of Anchorage, who are the living foundation stones of this community, to merge their ideas and resources, I am confident that a viable solution is attainable. In closing, another ancient Jewish proverb goes like this. He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. The way we care for the weakest among us will define who we are as citizens of Anchorage. As Alaskans, we should be the standard. Integrity and honor must be of the utmost importance to us all as the people of Alaska. Respectfully submitted. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming. Um, the next item before us is 11A, and this is the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission appointments. This was postponed to permit the 10-day public comment period, and there is no motion pending. Move to approve. Second. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Seeing none, this matter is approved, and I, we are then appointing um, Richard Morrison and Stacy Dean to PNZ. Are they here? Would you like to come forward and introduce yourself, please?
Hi, my name is Stacy Dean, and I'll be on the PNC. Well, we want to thank you very much for your service. That's a very, very important uh, commission, and that we read their reports regularly, and they have a lot of influence on what happens in this city. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. All right. Um, the next item is 11B, and um, there is a motion to approve on the floor. But Mr. Coffey? Madam Chair, uh, if you will recall, part of the uh, 11B was to await the report from the attorney uh, on uh, the resolution we passed several, well, probably back in March or maybe April. And uh, I met with him on Friday, and uh, he is approximately two weeks out from having it completed. And I obviously would like to have it completed before we address this uh, ordinance as well as the next one. And so I would move to, um, let's see, we've, we're done with the public hearing. So I would move to postpone this matter until the meeting of September 29th. That will allow us to get his report uh, and deal with it and not have to do so, you know, in, the, in a few days before the meeting of the 15th. So move to postpone till no, September 29th. Second. Oops. Is okay. there a discussion on the postponement? Is there objection to the postponement? All right, that item then is postponed to the 29th. The next item before us um, is also, mm -hmm. there's uh, a motion to, oh, there's no motion on this one. Yes, ma'am, move to uh, uh, postpone this matter till the 29th of September for the reasons stated regarding the previous motion. Second. Is there discussion about postponement? Is there objection? Seeing no objection, that oh. matter is postponed till the 29th. And we can deal with one more here and then take a short break. And um, this is item 13A. And I remind you that the administration has thought that they can deal with this without our involvement. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Madam Chair, move to postpone this matter indefinitely. Thank you. And the purpose of the postponement indefinitely was inappropriately put on our agenda. Alcohol related matters that deal with restaurant eating places or beer and wine licenses are, have been amended to be dealt with as an administrative site plan review. They are doing that. This matter should not be in front of us for those reasons. So I would post, I would support, ask you to vote to support the motion to postpone indefinitely. Is there discussion further? Is there objection to postponing indefinitely? Seeing none, this matter is postponed indefinitely. We're now going to take about a 20-minute dinner break, um, and then we'll be back beginning with the new public hearings. Thank you. We are at 14A on our agenda. And um, at this point, then, I'd like to open the public hearing for AO 101. This is an ordinance repealing and reenacting sections of code relating to organizations of the executive, executive branch. If anybody would like to speak to us on that, could you please come forward? Anyone like to speak to us? Hearing and seeing no one. Public hearing is, I'm sorry. This is on the screen. You can see what item we're on. This is an ordinance that changes how the city executive branch is structured. So, so if you'd like to speak to us about that item, now's the time to come forward. Madam Chair. Mr. You ready? Move to approve. Well, I'm okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Move to approve. All right. Discussion. Mr. Selkrig. Um, I just had a comment, uh, and that is, um, as I read through this, I, I understand the rationale of kind of concentrating all the transportation together, and um, and then the kind of an effort to pull together community planning and development. But my question is, is it, I'm a little concerned about public transportation. I, and I guess there's this, there's an intimate relationship between public transportation, uh, transportation planning, and land use. And I'm just hoping 
in the mix of this that public transportation kind of doesn't just disappear um, because it isn't integrated um, in the right places. And so I just, I don't know what your strategy is for that, but we have some of the, well, we have kind of, we're at the small end in terms of providing transportation, public transportation for our population. And it would be great to have this in a place where somebody could really focus on it and figure out how we could grow it a bit. So I just, any comments about how it's going to happen? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. We actually feel that this structure makes it more integrated than it was before. Okay. Not only that, if you look at the org chart, it's at the very top of the org chart. So that, uh... right. Thank you. Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, every administration has a way in which it wants to organize itself. And my experience over time has been that the, uh, this body, absent some very strange circumstances, which I have never seen, would say, yes to however the mayor would like to organize his administration, and I would urge a yes vote. Thank you. What was that? Mr. Coffey, anything else? No, ma'am. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I was going to make the same comment that Mr. Coffey made because I've been around a long time, and I've seen um, the executive organization change usually with, with every new administration. And this change looks real familiar to me. Um, we're going back to the way um, uh, the executive organ organization was organized um, in the past. And I, I, I don't have any issue with it at all because I think that it's each mayor's prerogative to um, change the organization as he or she sees fit. But the, the one question that I do have is, um, and I recognize that OEO used to be under Equal Rights Commission, but the prior administration elevated it to the, the mayor's um, office. And I just would like to know the rationale behind um, putting that one particular um, area back under Equal Rights, I, I'm sorry, the employee relations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Mayor? Yes, actually, uh, putting it up in the mayor's office, we didn't consider to be elevating it. They have to work so closely with employee relations to make sure that opportunities for employment in the city are well known throughout the community and, and that uh, a diverse workplace is known throughout the departments existing within the city as well. So they really do work hand in hand with employee relations and that is actually the more traditional structure and, and we just feel that works better in terms of accomplishing their mission. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Clayman. I had, I had a question with regard to partly looking at the organization chart and who reports to whom. Um, the Office of Management budget, or does anyone report directly to them or is that simply reporting to the mayor and then the mayor, then the employee relations chief fiscal officer and municipal manager report to the mayor? Yes, the Office of Management and Budget is a standalone department that reports directly to the mayor. And I take it the chief of staff as, and as well as the municipal attorney report only to the mayor and they don't supervise any of these other departments. That is correct. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. That's how I read the org chart and read the ordinance, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. Thank you. Dr. Selkirk. I just didn't get a chance. I, wa I do want to say that I plan to support this and I, I'm happy to see some concentrations of departments together that go together. It looks like it's going to work. So thanks very much for the work. Seeing no further discussion, is there objection to approval? Seeing no objection to approval, that item is approved 10 to, z 10 to 0. The next item before us is uh, 14B AO 103. This is an ordinance waiving Anchorage Municipal Code sections 3.30.179 and 3.30.168 for employment of relatives for the appointment and confirmation of Mark Hall to Chief of the Anchorage Fire Department. If anybody would like to speak to us on this, now's the time to come forward. What, what is waving? What are you waving? Uh, if you would like to cut copies of any of the ordinances that we're going to approve or discuss, they're available in the hall in the front. No, but what's your I'm sorry, I can't have that conversation in the middle of a meeting like this. Is there anyone who'd like to come forward? Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Yeah, okay, this matter is before us. Um, is there any discussion? Mr. Gutierrez. 
I, I have some discomfort with this, not not a tremendous amount, but um, one of the the issues that I I have seen, and and, and one of the things I, I've taken exception to um, from this body in the last several years is when the rules get in the way, when the rules are inconvenient. Well, we just change the rules. Um, in this case, it's a little different because I I think the rules were written for a different situation. We're waiving the rules so that someone who, by all accounts that I have heard, is, is more than qualified for the position, um, could become uh, the chief of the, of the fire department who has relatives already employed. I think these rules were written with the intention of preventing somebody who was already chief from hiring all of his relatives. And I think we all understand that, and I think that's that's why I don't have a tremendous amount of discomfort with this. I know there is um, what I think is a better way that uh, Mr. Coffey laid on the table this evening is the way I'd rather see this handled, but uh, at the same time, I also see the wisdom in not holding up an appointment, uh, which by every account that I've heard is a good appointment. Um, so I will be supporting this with the caveat that at some point we need to get past the idea that when the rules are inconvenient, you just change the rules. Uh, at some point, we have to learn to live within the rules. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Selkrig. Um, I, I do think that um, there's some challenges in our existing code regarding um, employee relations, relatives at, in the workplace. And I think the question really is how to solve it. And uh, I'm... I'm of the mind that um, if this is approved, I think we need at the same time um, to go back, not just at some point, but fairly quickly and figure out how we want to do this in a formal way and in code so that in the future we don't have to do an a ordinance that has somebody's name in it specifically to fix it, addressing really the issue um, that Mr. Gutierrez raised. Uh, I mean, it just seems like we, we need to take the time to, to fix this part of our code. Um, so that we are not in this bind again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, too, have my concerns with this. Um, I did look at the state's um, employment code, and it's far less restrictive than Anchorage is. I'm not understanding why this was done in the first place. I wish we had a bit of history on this. Um, and why we need to be more restrictive than the state does with far more employees, I cannot understand. Um, excuse me, I'll, uh, I'll come back. Okay, Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to either Mr. Wheeler or Ms. Tucker, I know we were looking into this. <clears throat> Could you confirm that in our research we have not found any uh, history of, of a waiver of Title III of, of a personnel code? Through the Chair, Assemblymember Flynn, um, I mentioned to you that I was not aware of a waiver, um, but uh, Deputy Municipal Attorney Westover has indicated that prior to the enactment of this code provision that we're working on, there was a waiver um, with respect to uh, Fire Chief Langston back in 1988, looks like. So my apologies to you for not being aware of that particular item. <clears throat> and if I recall correctly, and um, that appointment was part of the reason the code reads the way it does now, um, because that appointment did cause some, um, I guess, we'll say, difficulty within the fire department. Um, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, I don't think there's anybody at this table who would argue whether Mr. Hall is qualified for the position of fire chief. He certainly is. There's no question of that. Um, I guess I would echo Mr. Gutierrez's comments. The law is the law. Either we follow the rules or we don't. Now, uh, Ms. Drummond is correct. Our code, partly because of what happened in the late 80s, is tighter than the state statute. If you are in the 
a small village in rural Alaska, and you have to hire somebody within the village, and you outlaw all your cousins as potential uh, or nephews as potential employees, you're probably out of luck. So is there a public policy reason to have a tighter code in Anchorage? Perhaps. Is it reasonable to look at loosening the code to be more to closely aligned with the state statute? Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. However, um, I don't think it's appropriate for us to waive the code just because, unless we have found an overriding public policy reason to do so. And as of yet, I have not heard one expressed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Mr. Clayman. Uh, thank you. I, <clears throat> I, too, am troubled by the notion that we should, because the mayor um, has identified somebody that's certainly qualified, that we should ignore code provisions. And I was particularly struck when I looked at the particular code provision defining relative that it was, it was passed by the Assembly and approved by the Assembly in 1999 when now Mayor Sullivan was a member of the Assembly and, and then Assembly Member Sullivan voted in favor of this this code amendment that made it clear that nephews and nieces were included in relatives that, that had this apply. Um, and it's troubling now that now Mayor Sullivan wants to ignore an ordinance that he supported when it passed. Um, that's, that's troubling to me. The reasons, I think, why we have what I would describe as a nepotism policy or a policy prohibiting nepotism and and why it's stricter than the state code is because the state really has an issue in rural Alaska, as Mr. Flynn correctly notes, that if there's 100 people in the village and you can't hire a niece or a nephew, you may very well find you can't fill the positions. With 280,000 people in Anchorage, I haven't seen evidence that we have that problem. Um, there are real issues when you have your niece or nephew working for you in a department um, it's not just a question of decisions made in the in the so-called command decision as as fire chief. It's also you run into issues of promotion. What are we to do when a niece or a nephew is up for promotion uh, and has qualified for that? What is the what becomes the word in the department? How is that responded to? Um, and how does that affect morale within within a department such as the the fire department where people must work very closely with one another and have great trust and confidence. I'm certainly very familiar with the, what can be the advantages of nepotism. I remember when I was in college, one of the jobs that I had was I contacted my uncle who owned a business in another part of the country and asked if I could have a summer job. And he was happy to give me a summer job and a place to live in his house. And when I would go to work, the people at the workplace uh, would periodically chide me about the fact here I was a, some young kid that was there by the grace of his uncle's good generosity. Um, that's not the kind of environment I think we want in our fire department. And so I am, for the reasons that we established this nepotism provision, I will not support the waiver. If, if the case can be made that Anchorage should have a looser nepotism rule, then that it may be more similar to the state. If that can pass with the assembly, then I th certainly think at that point it may be appropriate to uh, appoint Mr. Hall as the fire chief, but until we amend the code, I, I will not support this waiver. Um, I would also note that I am very pleased that the work that uh, Acting Chief Shragi has done uh, in the last several weeks I have, I have had no complaints with. I have every confidence that while the Assembly may go through a process of trying to amend the code, um, that the fire department is in good hands. So I will not be supporting this waiver. Thank you. Ms. Greg Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've known Mark Hall for quite some time, even as far back when he was president of the, um, of the union. Um, and and I, I know that he's qualified, uh, and I believe that he is dedicated and would do a fabulous job for this community. But from the beginning, from the start, I've had problems with the vehicle that's being used to appoint him. It, in my mind, it's just simply not the right vehicle to do this. Um, I will echo comments made by Mr. Clayman that um, if indeed there is an, an ordinance offered um, for an induction this evening or on the 15th that will change to, to make revisions to the code, our code, to mirror the state's law, I would definitely consider that route, but, but I just simply cannot 
um, in good faith and conscience vote for a vehicle that I don't think is the, the right one for this um, appointment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, <clears throat> I'm a lot more troubled than I, I was before. And I thank Mr. Clayman for doing the research that, that I didn't do. And I would like to, to ask the mayor, I know it was a long time ago, but <clears throat> you voted yes on the current code. And I'd, I'd like to understand from your mind what you saw happening at the time and, and why you thought that was appropriate then because there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect now to, to toss it aside. Mr. Mayor? I, I didn't quite catch the true intent of your question. There. I'm sorry. I, I, what I would like to know is, is what Mr. Clayman brought up was the fact that as an assembly member, you voted yes on the current code that's in place that you're now asking us to waive. Oh. So if you could give us a historical perspective of what happened when you were an assembly member, and I, I presume that was probably in your first term, yeah. um, what, was, what was going on, why you thought this was necessary, why you voted yes, uh, and why we should now sort of set it aside? Yeah. Actually, uh, the original ordinance was passed in 1979, many years before I got on the assembly, and the revision that was made in 1999 was a minor change to it and didn't deal with the uh, uh, relationships, the, uh, you know, the nieces, nephews, that sort of stuff. So it, it was not the ordinance that you're thinking was the main body of the ordinance at all. It was just a minor technical change to it. And, uh, Do you recall what that, that change was? I know it was a long time ago. Oh, we probably got a copy of it. Maybe we can get that later because there's a number of people in queue. Is that all right, Mr. That, that's, and I apologize to the mayor. I can't remember what I did last week. So, no. I, I but again, I, I do remember that it was not, again, this ordinance passed 20 years before that, and the change in 1999 was, again, not a substantive change to the, the body and the relationships uh, as far as the nepotism goes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Anything else, Mr. Gutierrez? No, Mr. Coffey. Thank you. There, there are two ways to go about what we're about. First, I don't, as Mr. Flynn said, I don't think anyone at the table disagrees that Mr. Hall is capable, qualified, and when we get done figuring out how, we will support him uh, as chief. That's my belief. I heard, having heard the arguments earlier in this week, like Monday, that the process was flawed through a waiver, I prepared a, uh, with uh, Julia Tucker's help, we prepared, she prepared, and I discussed with her an amendment which I uh, have here and which I'm probably prepared to hand out and people can think about it. Um, my hope was that if there were a code that required amendment, which I believe after looking at how the school district does it and how the state of Alaska does it, our code could use a little improvement. And that's fine. And if it is the ultimate desire of this body to keep Mr. Hall twisting in the wind for two or three more weeks while we fix an ordinance, as opposed to recognizing that once we fix the ordinance, waivers will no longer be necessary, then I suppose that's what we'll do. My advice and request to this body is that we grant the waiver. It, to my way of thinking, d addresses the problem in the same way that the state and the, uh, and the proposed ordinance that Ms. Tucker prepared at my request will deal with it, which is by putting qualifications on the waiver. And that's according to Ms. Tucker, that is managing the issue of nepotism, which is the way the state handles it and the school district handles it. So if the ordinance passes two or three weeks hence and something like this arises again, we will be faced with a similar situation where we say, okay, this person is qualified, and here are the three, four, seven conditions that we are going to put on to ensure that this recognition of relation, blood relationship uh, between uh, a supervisor and an employee is protected from the evils that are recognized in nepotism. So what is the, my question to my fellows is, what is the harm today of conditioning a waiver when we are going to probably pass an ordinance that will deal with management with conditions if the situation ever arises and allow Mr. Hall to take the position he's going to take and us to deal with the ordinance in our course of business in the future. And I would urge that we do that and I will hand out my ordinance 
uh, and everybody can read it, and if they like it, we can move to introduce it tonight and deal with it on the 15th. And that's what I would like us all to do. Thank you. Ms. Sofrig. Um, I'm happy that um, Mr. Coffey is handing out his ordinance. I just told him that if he didn't move it, I would move it, because it seems to me if, if, if we were concerned as a, at a, as a body that um, Mr. Hall's position as chief would result in inappropriate nepotism and our mayor was trying to trick us and bring about a change or a, a special ordinance to allow something bad to happen, I would vote against this. But I think as a body, we know that fundamentally Mr. Hall can serve as chief um, with his nephews in the department and um, be separated from them enough to function in an appropriate manner. And I, I pretty much heard each person on this body indicate that. And it seems to me um, holding it up for three weeks when we really fundamentally don't have a problem with, with his behavior and his ability to serve isn't really worth it. However, I do think we've got kind of a messy code situation and we're right in the middle of it. And I think it's essential, since we're here, to deal with this appropriately. And so therefore, I look forward to um, Mr. Coffey moving um, his ordinance and for us to act on this as soon as possible, which will basically supersede um, the act that we do tonight. So I just think it's a matter of efficiency. I think that there are some people who are unhappy uh, about the choice of Mr. Hall in, in the community, and I think there are some people who are very happy, but the fact is is that um, our mayor has selected him, and it appears to me he doesn't have a nepotism problem, and it also appears to me that he's competent and ready to serve, and I think we have a lot of business before us in this community right now that's very serious. We've got budgets to build. We've got to get going, and to drag our feet on this, I think it's just, in some ways, it's just kind of flexing political muscle when it's not really a very effective place to be effect, uh, flexing it. Thank you. Mr. Birch. I speak in favor of the uh, uh, ordinance and the waiver in front of us this evening. Uh, uh, the, the mayor has been uh, elected to, to lead this city and to put in place the staff and the resources necessary to accomplish that goal. Uh, Mr. Hall uh, has, uh, by, by all indications and, and, and everything I can see, an impeccable record of, of leadership and, and management and experience with the city. And, and frankly, this is a time when we need leadership and management and experience in, in uh, administering our, our city resources uh, with a, a more limited budget. So I, I think, I, you know, I, if we need to, to work on a secondary ordinance to modify the uh, uh, municipal code uh, sections, uh, so be it. Uh, we can deal with that in three weeks. But I, I think we should not uh, uh, delay uh, approving this ordinance this evening and speak in favor. Thanks. Mr. Clayman. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I appreciate the concerns expressed by certain assembly members. But, you know, when you really look at the history of what the assembly does, I mean, I can't, can't really count how many times we've passed ordinances that say is notwithstanding other provisions of the code. I mean, we make exceptions all the time. And in this case, this is a, a, a proper mechanism to use because we do have a very strict code. And in order to meet the current situation, a waiver accomplishes that without changing the code. Uh, you could find yourself, you know, trying to alter the code in every situation that might come up, and you can't anticipate every situation. So a waiver, quite frankly, is, a, is an appropriate tool to use. And keep in mind, the assembly is in ultimate control of whenever a waiver, you know, might come before it. You know, you're the body that gets to vote on whether to approve a waiver or not. You have to be satisfied that, uh, as in this particular case, that there's enough degrees of separation between uh, the person being appointed and any relatives. Uh, the waiver does have provisions in it that uh, make sure that separation stays in place. So, you know, again, uh, we, we use that phrase notwithstanding many times in our uh, enactment of, of law, and it's appropriate in this case because, again, the other guarantees are there. So I would urge the body to uh, approve the waiver. Let's uh, move forward with having uh, uh, Mr. Hall become Chief Hall, and we can then uh, I think uh, I would agree that uh, other changes by ordinance to the provisions of nepotism are probably appropriate down the road. Mr. Gutierrez. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for being in the queue a third time, but I, I appreciate your indulgence, and I'll be brief. <clears throat> Mr. Coffey asked the question, what's the difference, basically, between a waiver and waiting a couple of weeks and, and, and changing the code? The answer is fairly simple. One is a policy choice about the appropriateness of a law and, and what that law should read, and the other is changing the rules because it's inconvenient for one person. I, I chafe at that. I also chafe at the suggestion that there's any political muscle being flexed because I don't think we'd find anybody up here who's expressed any trepidation about Mr. Hall as, as fire chief. Um, from, from what I've heard, um, you know, he's someone who cares greatly about the department and wants to make it better. And that, in my mind, is, is the primary qualification for being the fire chief. Um, I'm just, I'm becoming less and less comfortable with the idea of the, again, the rules are inconvenient, so let's change the rules. If the law doesn't work, if we found a situation in which the law is complicating things in a way that, that wasn't anticipated when it was written, and that happens all the time, there are unanticipated consequences to every word we put down on paper, then we need to fix those so that we don't run into this again. Um, but I am becoming less and less comfortable with just changing the rules in the middle of the game because they're inconvenient for us. I'd prefer to have a fourth strike when I'm at bat playing softball. I don't get to change the rules. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all. Ms. Greg Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to make one brief comment. Um, and, and Ms. Selkraig, it, it has nothing to do with, it was just a comment that you made and not, nothing to do with you personal, personally, honestly. Um, but you mentioned we just don't want to, you know, flex our muscles, you know. But I can tell every single person in this room and on TV, um, for me, it's not about flexing my muscle because I have to remember when I wake up in the morning that I'm an assembly member. Really, that's how laid back I am in doing the, the work for the people in this community. I just really feel that this vehicle is not the proper way to um, deal with an executive appointment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Clayman. Thank you. A couple of a couple of points. First, Mr. Sullivan or Mayor Sullivan makes some reference to what was passed in nineteen or in nineteen ninety nine and what was originally passed in nineteen seventy nine. And what struck me, I looked at the nineteen seventy nine ordinance and it actually in what was online for that ordinance, I could not find the actual definition of personal relationship. And when I looked at what was passed in nineteen ninety nine, it specifically notes that it's it's repealing the entire section and adding a new definition for personal relationships. I, in my research, which I didn't have as much time as I think the Department of Law may have had, but I was unable to find the code as it was written from 1979, uh, and, it, and at least by title, it was a new definition of personal relationship. Um, having said that, I, I think there's another side to the nepotism equation, which is another reason why I think the debate should not be about are we going to pass approve Mark Hall tonight, but I think the debate should be, should we amend the code? I think the real concern with nepotism is not about decisions that, well, some of the impact of the decisions that an uncle in this case may make as fire chief, but what about the promotion issues regarding his nephews? Here's a, here's a gentleman who's got two young firefighters who may, in the next six years, if, if Dan Sullivan stays mayor for a six-year period, they may come up for promotion. And how is that going to be handled, and, and how will the department react if either his nephews do get promoted or don't get promoted? These are the kinds of policy questions that are, that are, that are important for this body to debate and debate in a meaningful way, and we need to have that debate before we approve Mark Hall as our fire chief. So I will, again, be voting no on this particular proposal. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. <clears throat> when it comes to promotions, um, in the fire department, is that based on merit or is it based on test? Is there a basic rule of thumb as far as promotions? I mean, what I'm trying to say is it more objective than it is subjective? Who, who do you want to answer that? Uh, well, Chief Shroggy, would you, would you be you willing talk? to speak to the assembly on how promotions are handled? <clears throat> Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the answer to the question is uh, most 
uh, promotions involve some sort of uh, written testing and uh, interview in front of an oral board, uh, which is composed of several officers from the department. Anything else, Ms. Johnson? So, so it's a written testing, and, and then as far as the oral interview, is that usually battalion chiefs, or is it, I mean, how many degrees of separation would there be between the chief and his nephews? Well, it, it depends on what position it is, on who, who, on what the board is comprised of. Sometimes it's uh, captains, sometimes battalion chiefs. But there would be some degrees of separation, and, and there is an objective test that they have to pass. Yes, and I believe it could be uh, in the particular cases that we might uh, be imagining. Uh, I think uh, we could take measures to make sure that that separation existed. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you. Just to uh, concur with what the chief said, we did send the assembly a memo uh, four days ago that outlined that there are indeed four levels of separation between the chief and, and his nephews, the deputy chief for operations, a division chief, a battalion chief, and a senior captain. And I think uh, we've all discussed the fact that uh, ours is more restrictive than most, not only in definition of who's covered, but um, you know, Mr. Vakalis here recently served with the school district, and their standard is two degrees of separation, and I believe he said it was the same in the military as well. So, you know, there's already a built-in a uh, higher degree of separation in this situation than exists in just about any other uh, municipal or state agency. Um, and then in the waiver itself, if you'll read, I mean, we've, again, put conditions in here to make sure that uh, as this waiver is in effect, that there are indeed standards that make sure that that separation stays in place. So, you know, if there is concern about uh, any sort of interaction between the chief and his nephews that would benefit them, uh, I just don't think that exists, and we put in extra conditions to make sure it doesn't exist. So, it, uh, again, I, I just have to harken back to the fact that uh, the Assembly, on numerous occasions, changes the code by saying the term notwithstanding other provisions of the code. I mean, it, it happens all the time where the code does not fit the exact situation that you'd like. And so, you know, you have the power, essentially, to say, we're going to ignore that provision of the code on this particular instance because it is not only convenient, but the proper thing to do. And this is no different than that uh, that I can see in, in any regard. So for those who are concerned about process, I mean, that is part of the process. And that's why the Assembly has the power to do that on a case-by-case -case basis, analyzing the facts and making a judgment call. Uh, in the future, if a waiver was presented to you and there wasn't that degree of separation, if those facts weren't in place, if the waiver didn't have the right conditions, you would be proper to say no. But in this case, all those conditions are there, and that's what makes it a good waiver. Dr. Selfred. I, I'm uh, a little bit confused about some aspects of our discussion. Uh, on one hand, what we have before us is a ordinance um, to confirm Mark Hall basically addressing the issue of nepotism and, the, and protections around it. I mean, basically what we're looking at is a tool to allow us to approve someone that's brought before us. And, uh, Mr. Clayman raised the issue of separation and whether there was adequate separation. So I guess one of the things, are we worried that Mr. Hall, in fact, um, isn't going to be performing his duty? Uh, my impression of the tone of this discussion is that we're not, we feel like Mr. Hall will be able to um, function in an appropriate way. And what the mayor's provided us with is a structure to address the issues around nepotism um, and to set the boundaries and to set our expectations. And it seems to me if, I guess it's, it's unclear to me why we're so stuck. Um, it, and I am, I'm in, actually Ms. Gray Jackson pointed out um, the state approach to this problem to me yesterday and I thought that it was the appropriate way to model ourselves. Um, it seemed like a smart way to go. And so it seems to me the thing to do tonight is to go ahead, approve this, and then immediately make the corrections in our, our code um, so that we line it up um, with what our intentions are and actually create something that doesn't require waivers or special actions, but that functions across the board. So it's just a little confusing to me um, 
why this is so hard, but maybe I'm just not seeing it quite the same way. And, and I didn't mean to offend the body. I, I apologize for implying the political implications. Thanks. Mr. Gutierrez? Madam Chair, I actually would, would like to have a moment to confer with the administration on this issue. I would move at this time that, that we continue this until time certain of 8 o'clock so that we can move on with our agenda. If if I can chat with the administration briefly and and, and then we can take this item up again in a few minutes. Is if there, there's a second. second. Is there objection to continuing this to 8 o'clock? Seeing none, then we'll um, put this on the table a little later in the evening. All right, the next item before us is um, 14C. This is AO100. It's an ordinance amending code 4.50.070 Education and Workforce Advisory Commission to change the name of the commission to the School Budget Advisory Commission. If anybody would like to speak to this, please come forward. Good evening. I'm Carol Como, superintendent with the school district. Assembly uh, Chair Osiander, members of the assembly, I just wanted to let you know we are strongly supporting this change. I had an occasion to discuss this with the mayor before he was inaugurated and with um, Mr. Baker uh, when he and I met on another uh, topic because it's been my sense and the school board's sense that since um, the change that there has been Herculean work on the part of this commission as far as workforce development, really looking prospectively Effectively on how to um, embrace that as a community. And I think that um, it has become clear to me in the last couple of reports that have been made uh, to you uh, about our budget that there didn't seem to be as much credibility uh, from you towards the report about our budget. And so I think this can be a step forward into you having a school budget advisory committee again whose sole purpose is to review the Anchorage School District's budget um, and to become much more knowledgeable as their focus so I think this is a step forward um, in that regard I do think it's important to emphasize that I hope that all the work that the Commission did on workforce development uh, they've got quite a list in their strategic plan that I hope that um, either a separate group could be formed or working in conjunction with the chamber because they are actively working on the same issue and so I think that might be helpful but I just wanted to say that I think this is a good step and hopefully it will um, improve our credibility with some of you um, as far as is our budget being scrutinized adequately is it um, being reviewed to the sense that a lot of you feel has not been so I just wanted to say that thank you thank you very much is that it uh, there's no questions is there anyone else who'd like to address us on this issue hearing and seeing no one Public hearing is closed. Move to Second. Discussion? Okay. You're faster. Seeing no discussion, is there objection? Seeing no objection, this matter is approved 10 to 0. Thank you very much. The next item before us is item 14D. This is AO 102. It's an ordinance amending the effective date of um, a previously approved item AO40S, which was in relation to the Anchorage Food Code and amended fine schedule. If anybody would like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. Thank you. The next item before us is 14E. This is AO 97. It's an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code to delete Chapter 21.60 in its entirety and authorize subsection 21.040080D to be effective immediately. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to us on this matter? If so, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Is there discussion? Is there objection? 
Seeing none, this matter is approved um, 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Um, the next item was one that Mr. Gutierrez was interested in um, declaring a conflict. So I am going to, with the body's approval, if you don't object, just pass that one by very briefly. I know he's not, well, Mr. Flynn, he expressed to me he needed to say something about this matter. So if you do not object, I'm going to instead go to 14G. Does anyone on the assembly object to that? Seeing none, um, then we'll move to 14G. Well, this is one that Mr. Coffey wanted to speak to, and he's not here. Well, I'm trying to remember. Did we specifically you could call the house? That? No, that's all right. If if there's agreement that I've already declared that he has Mr. A Coffey's returned. Okay, Mr. Coffey, can you confirm I that in this matter of this liquor license that I declared you had a conflict? Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay, goodbye, Mr. Coffey. You've ruled on that already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to open the public hearing on AR 183. This is a resolution of the Assembly for action on a proposed transfer of ownership of a beverage dispensary liquor license, number 309 to 222 Incorporated. If anyone would like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hello, sir. Hello. To uh, the chair and to the Assembly, my name is Kevin Anderson. I'm uh, representing Mr. Thacker who's the proposed transferee on this license. I have to declare ahead of time that I have a potential conflict that Mr. Thacker has uh, waived. I'm a member of the Board of Equalization, which you appoint, so basically I work for you. Um, Mr. Thacker has waived his conflict in that regard, and I have to make sure that the Assembly understands and waives any conflict that might be um, present because of my representing Mr. Thacker. Would you like me to ask the body if anybody has any concern about that? That'd be fine, Your Honor. All right. Does anybody have any concern with him representing Mr. Thacker because of his uh, his? Uh, there's a question on that. Go ahead. My question is: You're here. You're an attorney, and you're here representing Mr. Thacker. In That's your correct. Capacity as a private attorney. I'm in my capacity as a private attorney. That's and, correct. And although you're on the board of equalization, um, your loyalty is to your client, not to the board of equalization, on this matter. On this particular matter, my loyalty is to my client. I don't think there's any conflict that I do have to declare. Yeah, that's fine. I don't think there's a conflict either. I just wanted to make clear that for Through the, the purposes chair, of what you're here, it's for, the, it's for this matter. All right. Anyone else on this potential conflict? Yes, All right. Well, go ahead, Ms. Drummond. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Anderson was present at the um, uh, Public Safety Committee meeting, which uh, I triggered on this issue when it was before us uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, he, he expressed the same conflict to the Public Safety Committee, and the Public Safety Committee had no problem with that. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you for telling us about that. Thank you, Madam so, Chair. So let's go ahead and start his time now, then. Madam go Chair, uh, to the Assembly, Mr. Thacker cannot take a security interest in a liquor license under public law. However, this license has been pledged against a debt that Mr. Thacker is owed, um, that was uh, monies that were paid to the licensee, uh, Mr. Francisco Baraja. Mr. Baraja has gone out of business. Mr. Thacker seeks to essentially obtain possession of the license so that he can sell it. He has no desire to operate the license. Um, he seeks the board, uh, excuse me, the assembly's um, approval of the transfer of the license so that he can present it to the ABC board, obtain the license, and present it for sale. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Are there any questions? Mm -mm. Mr. Clayman has one. As, as I, his intent is to get the license so he can sell it as soon as possible. That's correct, and Your Honor. With That's no correct. intent to operate a liquor store? No, op no intent to operate through the chair. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? There appear to be no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to us on this matter? Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is, wait, Mr. Gutierrez, did you want to speak? No, Madam Chair, okay. on the motion. Okay. Uh, public hearing is closed. What's the wish Move of the body? Approve. Move Second. to approve. All right, that matter is before us. Discussion. Mr. Gutierrez? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I um, 
the Public Safety Committee heard this issue and appreciate the time that Mr. Thacker and, and Council took to come speak to us. If you'll notice in your packet, the second page is a letter from Mr. Thacker dated May 18th. Um, and I believe, and I apologize, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch up. Uh, Mr. Thacker stated very clearly his intention was not to operate this license, uh, but to try to retrieve um, his investment in it. And uh, I believe that the, the uh, resolution that we have before us is appropriate. The, the Public Safety Committee agreed, and I would recommend approval. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to this? Is there any objection to this matter? Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. As, as long as um, we have the ability to come back in and um, object if Mr. Thacker does end up operating this license, I believe there are time limits on the t amount of time that it cannot be operated. Uh, I believe those have all been laid out in this, um, in this resolution. And uh, hopefully that will that should cover us if uh, if we choose to approve this um, transfer. Did, did you want to ask that as a question, or was that just a discussion, Mr. I'm, uh, Mr. Anderson, if you would assure us, I'd appreciate it. If I may, I'll bring up Mr. Thacker. You can question him directly. Thank Mr. Thacker. Well. You may want the municipal attorney to. I would not even consider operating one of those licenses. I would let them go back to the state and they could go on the shelf before I would operate a liquor license in Anchorage. Thank you very much, Mr. Thacker. Thank that you. satisfies me. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further discussion, is there objection? Seeing no objection, this matter is approved 10 to 0. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. This matter was nine to zero. I'm sorry. I forgot Mr. Coffey was conflicted out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. You. Return, Mr. Coffey. All right. Mr. Gutierrez, um, yes, you had wanted to speak on F. So, well, I'm about to be there if you're okay, okay with that. All right. I'd like then to bring, could we, be quiet in the back, please. Thank you. We're now at AO 90. This is an ordinance amending the zoning map providing for the rezoning of approximately 40,500 square feet from R4 to B3SL with special limitations for Mountain View subdivision. Block 2, Lot 2, North 1 half, Lot 3, East 1 third, North 1 half, Lot 3, Wait, um, thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, would you like me to declare my I conflict would. now? I would, sir. I, I, I um, would like to declare a possible conflict on this issue. The lot in question is owned by the Anchorage Community Land Trust, which is the fiscal agent for the Mountain View Weed and Seed Program, of which earlier, as I stated, I am the site coordinator. I do not work for the Land Trust. However, the chief executive officer for the Land Trust is the one who signs my paycheck. So I leave right. it to the body and to the chair as to whether or not I have a conflict on this issue. All right. I think we're going to go through the series of questions, Mr. Gutierrez. Do you have a financial interest in this business? No. All right. Do you have a private interest in the matter that would make it difficult for you to act in the public interest? No. Do you believe that if you participated in this matter, it would create any loss of public yes. trust in our body? No. Uh, to, to, in fact, my... The land trust and I have had absolutely no discussions about this project whatsoever and frankly wasn't aware of it until I looked at the agenda tonight. All right. I'm going to rule that Mr. Gutierrez does not have a conflict of interest. With that, I'm going to open the public hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Potter. Madam Chair, members of the Assembly, my name is Tim Potter with Dell HKM representing the Anchorage Community Land Trust tonight in a request to rezone uh, a number of lots that are currently zoned R4 in Mountain View uh, to B3 with special limitations. Um, the land trust currently owns seven lots uh, within this area, three of which are zoned R4, three of which are B3 at the current time, and one which is split zoned with R4 and B3. The attempt is to consolidate the property 
into a common zoning district. We've worked uh, diligently with the community council and the neighbors to reach an agreement on the special limitations which would require uh, site plan review if anything other than the um, Mountain View Arts and Cultural Center is developed on this property as well as a list of prohibited uses that were reviewed and approved by the community council and there is a requirement that prior to the effective um, uh, rezone uh, going forward that it would have to be replatted into a single tract rather than leave it at a current seven lots. Um, so with that, this is the old Johns RV Park property, if any of you are familiar with that. The project to go here is the Mountain View Arts and Cultural Center, which is considered a linchpin um, project in the renaissance of the Mountain View community, um, fully supported by the community and the um, community council. Um, they've been looking for and trying to get this project off the ground um, for years and the issue has been the location of a suitable site. There's been several sites that have been brought forward and failed for a number of different reasons, including geotechnical reasons. And this is the preferred site and the rezone is necessary to make this project go forward. I've got architectural drawings, site plans and that if there's any specific questions, um, I'd appreciate your support. Thank you. There appear to be no questions at this time. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us on this matter? Hearing and seeing no one. Public hearing is closed. Move to approve. This matter is before us. Is there discussion? Mr. Birch. It's it, in the same uh, area of the, I believe that, is it the Glen Square? That's just right across the street, right? Correct. Mr. Potter, would you come to the I, microphone? Well, I, I'm just. Yeah, but his, the record needs to indicate his answer. Relatively close. Relatively close. What, what's the status of that? I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, lease space in there. And uh, I mean, is that, does that compete with this at all? or? No, it does not. It doesn't? Okay. Th this will be a um, nonprofit uh, organization that is managing the operation of this facility. Um, and uh, we'll have a very small commercial component like a gift shop, and that would be it. Primarily, it is educational space, um, art studios, gallery space, writing laboratories, and a small administration area. Okay, thank you. Southwick. I'm just assuming that there's been a financial analysis done on the use of this building in terms of the art community actually using it and if you've done some sort of survey of, of, of I mean, I'm just, will you, if you build it, will they come? Um, uh, actually, yes, they will. Uh, there has been an analysis done and, and in fact, it's been an interesting exercise of a private nonprofit foundation interests and the private sector through um, JL Properties who stepped in and acted as that financial advisor, initiated the studies, looked at the building cost, and, and evaluated whether or not this project could actually work or not. And it's going to Please. pencil. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Clem. I just want to speak in support of this project. I, I know that, I think Mr. Potter will confirm, they actually looked at a number of different sites in Mountain View, including some that are along Mountain View Drive, uh, and those were that are closer to Glen Square, and those were determined not they wouldn't work. And this was really after a lot of study and a lot of a lot of people getting involved, they concluded this was the best site for this to move forward. And it, and as a product, they really developed a lot of support both within the Mountain View community, but also within the nonprofit community in Anchorage, uh, and others that want to contribute to make this happen. So I think it's a great example of the community working together and not taking the first option, but continuing to look until they really had an option that will work. So I'll be pleased to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there, seeing no further discussion, is there objection? Seeing no objection, this matter is approved 10 to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, at this point, I'm gonna go back to the Mark Hall waiver issue. And as you recall, there was a motion on the floor, um, and Mr. Gutierrez had, had asked for a, requ a request for a little bit of time. 
Um, Mr. Gutierrez, do you still have the floor if there's anything? I'm ready to vote unless there's someone else in the queue, Madam Chair. There are three people in the queue at this point. Ms. Gray Jackson. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll pass. Thank you. All right. Mr. Flynn. I, I had a couple of follow-up questions for Mr. Shiragi. Um It's Mr. Okay. Flynn, sir. Mr. I called Mr. Flynn, didn't I? I thought you said Mr. Clayman. I'm sorry. I've got you, you right after him. I'm, I'm happy to wait. All right. Mr. Flynn, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Selkirk asked the question as to, you know, what the concern was about this. And, and since other people often write better than I can and speak, I'll simply read a piece of an email I received uh, earlier today. It says, uh, I know Mark and think he's a great guy and more than qualified. My concern as a citizen of Anchorage is the proposed waiver. There is no compelling public need for the waiver. If the waiver is passed, the Assembly is setting a precedent that will be cited whenever a similar waiver, and we only know of one other one in the history of the municipality, and it ended badly, whenever a similar waiver comes up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Clayman. And my apologies. My hearing sometimes fails me. Two questions, or actually, it's a combined question from Mr. Shroggy. Um, you talked about degrees of separation. What happens in a circumstance if, if, uh, in, if this were to come forward that either of Mr. Hall's nephews were to be up for promotion to battalion chief or captain? What kind of separation would exist in that situation? Well, under the current uh, process, there would be an interview panel that the chief would sit on. But uh, in, in which case, for battalion chief, there would be, well, there would be three degrees of separation. Chief, deputy chief, assistant chief, and then battalion chief. But the, the actual promotion decision, at least under current rules, the chief would participate in that selection process for a battalion chief or a captain? Traditionally, yes, the chief has uh, participated. I think in this uh, circumstance, we would uh, probably defer that to, well, to me, the deputy chief. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you. Um, once again, I refer to the um, ordinance, and if you look at section two, the waiver is conditioned on the fire chief avoiding any direct supervision of the two relatives employed and delegation of any financial or promotional decisions to a deputy chief. So that's covered in the waiver. I think people just need to read through the ordinance again. I think we put sufficient provisions in there. And quite frankly, as an administration, we just simply wouldn't allow it. Thank you. There's no one else in the queue. So at this point, I'd like to ask if there's objection to approval. Yes, there is. All right, we'll put this on the board. Um, there you go. Please vote. So a yes vote approves the waiver and a uh, no vote. A yes not. vote approves the memorandum in front of you or the ordinance in front of you. Can I say something about uh, relating? No, sir, you can't speak out in the middle of the meeting. And that matter is approved by a vote of six to four. Madam Chair, move immediate reconsideration. Urge a no vote. Immediate reconsideration recon has been called. Hold on, I'm trying to clear the board here. Is Harriet? Yeah. I too will urge a no vote. All right. I'm having technical problems. I'll ask if there's objection to How a no I vote. Maybe All right. Is there objection to a no vote? Fine. Seeing none, then immediate reconsideration. Madam failed. Chair, can I ask a point of personal privilege? Speak your point, Mr. Ma Croft. Madam Chair, I'd like to ask to be able to introduce AO 209107, which is the amendment to the code that I have passed out here just a moment ago. Second. I'd like to get a second or third. We can schedule third. a public hearing. Well, it appears <laughs> that your question has automatically been taken as an introduction, yes. Mr. Croft. <laughs> Thank you. Move to introduce. <laughs> I think that yes. happened, but let's do it properly. Second. Thank you. Third. All right. I was going to sit, allow this under special orders, but I think considering considering the um, response that we got, I didn't hear any objection to that. I would request a public hearing on the 15th of September. Um, that is a pretty full agenda. Make it the 29th. But, well, let's try it on the 15th, and we may have to defer it. That's good. Well, All right. I don't want to load it up. There's not a rush now. No. 
Well, I, I actually, as a person that voted against this, I would like to see it on the 15th, so and I have I. no That's problem with it well. pushed over. 15th so is fine, Madam. All right, 15th is fine. Is there objection to that date? All right, that would that set then and introduced for hearing on the 15th. Thank you for the consideration, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, the next item, item, excuse me, before Adam. us is uh, we're down all the way now to 14H. And I'd like to open the public hearing on Ordinance 93. This is an ordinance authorizing a non-exclusive telecommunications and electrical easement within the Chester Valley School subdivision, plat number 69137. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us on this matter? If so, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14I. This is an ordinance 94, again authorizing a non-exclusive telecommunications and electrical easement within parcel. Reading. Thank you. Anyone like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is Ordinance 96. This is an ordinance again authorizing the municipality to grant a telecommunications and electrical easement. Wait, across. reading. All right. This is a different property, and so I'd like it to be on the board so people know which one. Thank you. Anyone like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14K, Ordinance 98. This is a Ma Madam Chair, move to combine the public hearings on 14K and 14L. They both deal with AWW borrowings. Is there a second? second? Is there objection to combining those public hearings? Seeing none, we're going to combine them. Um, this will be then a public hearing on both 98 and 99. They both relate to the AWWU capital improvement budget and relate to potentially borrowing some money. $27,134,000 in one case and $28,612,000 in another case from the State of Alaska Clean Water Fund. Point of order, Madam Chair. State your point. Madam Chair, I intend at the time to move to continue the public hearing. I've been advised that Mr. Mark Primo is not in town, and I have had requests from other Assembly members for a work session on the uh, continued borrowing of AWWU. Uh, I gave notice of my concerns about two months ago and said at some point in time we need to uh, address how much we're borrowing and make sure we're, uh, this body needs to receive the assurances that we are not uh, taking too much debt on. And this is a $55 million debt, so I would request a, work, a postponement and a work session, and I would ask that you tell the public that if they wish to testify. Okay. It would be better subsequently. And, Ms. Mr. Coffey, there is a representative from AWWU here. All right. At this point, okay, I'm, and I think people have heard that that is um, a request and probably a, an intent. But if you would like to speak to us on this matter, you still may. So if anyone would like to come forward, now is the time. Hearing and seeing none, no one, I'm going to assume then that I'm going to... Mr. Coffey, would you object if we just saw if there was objection from AWWU with continuation? No, I think we should continue the public hearing to allow for it to occur after we've had the work session. So I, my motion would be well, to go Mr. ahead. Mr. Coffey, the reason I ask that is I discussed this briefly with the administration yes. on Monday, and they said they were going to check with AWWU to see if there was a financial impact for delay. I have not heard that response back. Well, I think it would be back. wise to hear that, sure. So I would be interested in that if you don't object. I have no objection, Madam Chair. All right. Could you come forward, please? And I think the question is just specific to, to the impact of delay, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Kurt Boss, the Engineering Division Director from AWWU. 
uh, specific to that question, we can tolerate a delay to continue this till the 15th of uh, September without adverse financial impact. However, because these projects are under construction, they are part of the 2009 capital improvement program approved previously by the assembly, we do need to con we do need to wrap this up and we do need to uh, bring it to a closure on the 15th. Okay. If assembly members have concerns or questions, should they direct them to you or uh, yes. Okay. If we then will proceed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, there's been, then, would you like to make a motion to continue? Move to continue the public hearing till September 15th and request a work session on the Friday before. Um, is there a problem with having a work session on the Friday before, Mr. Bacalis or Mr. Uh, Sullivan? That works? All right, we'll schedule one then. Is there an objection to the continuation? Hearing and seeing none, we'll continue it right. until the 15th and we'll have a work session prior. I'll confer with the clerk on a time and we'll post that. Madam, Thank you. Madam Chair, if I might. Go ahead. Uh, what, I'm, what I would like to hear at the work session would be sort of a report on where we stand with regard to our indebtedness and the effects on our rates and, our, and the consequences relative to the ability of AWU to either pay a dividend uh, and so forth. And I would also like some discussion at that time where we stand relative to the court's decision on uh, the, uh, of course, it slips my mind the term now that we have, the, the taxation issue that was resolved by the Supreme Court recently. So if we could have those two resolved or reported to us, then I think I'll have my questions answered. Thank you very much. Um, Musa, Mr. Coffey, Musa. Mr. Boss, could we do that in an hour, do you think? Uh, yes. All right, I'm going to set that for September 11th at noon. All right, Ms. Johnson, do you have a comment? Go, Ms. Ms. Johnson, you're confusing me. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <clears throat> the other thing I would like as far as just timelines on each of these construction projects where they are in construction planning or if it's something that's out a year or two. Thank you. All right. Anybody else on the topic of this work session? Okay. And seeing no objection then, we'll go ahead and continue this and have that work session scheduled. Thank you. The next item before us then, and I'm, Mr. Coffee, I apologize. Did you make that motion for both of them? Yes, ma'am. If I didn't, it was for both K and L. The clerk informs me you just did it for K. Could you do okay, it? Okay, then for I'll L? do it for L. Motion to postpone the public Con hearing. Continue. continue the public hearing till September 15th and request the work session on the 11th. All right. Is there objection? There appears to be none, so we'll Thank do you. that too. Thank you. All right. The next item before us is 14M. This is AR 188. It's a resolution appropriating $174,841. Way of reading. Okay. If we could get that on the board before I open the public hearing, so people see. Uh, I'm hoping. Thank you. If you'd like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Discussion? Objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14 in AR 191. There's a resolution appropriating $437,265. Right, this is for the continuation of the Alaska Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. You want to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14O AR 192. This is a resolution appropriating $43,162 of proceeds from vehicle insurance recoveries. Of Wave reading. Okay, this is relating to the Public Transportation Capital Fund. Madam Clerk, can I waive the reading of all the dollar amounts? So moved. 
Okay. All right. Would you like to, anyone who'd like to speak to us on this, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14P. This is AR 193. It's a resolution appropriating a Federal Transit Administration grant um, of $5,960,310. Wave reading. Thank you. This is also related to Public Transportation Department preventative and capital maintenance. Anyone like to speak to us on this matter? Please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? Objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is 14Q. This is AR 194, a resolution appropriating $910,489 from the reading. state of Alaska. This is for the Human Services Community Matching Grant Program. If anybody would like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Second. I'd leave Move a motion. To She's already, in, she'd already clicked in. We're doing, I was it, watching. Dig, we're doing it digitally. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I wasn't fast enough Sorry. then. All right. That matters before us. Is there a discussion? Is there objection? No. Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is AR 196. This is a resolution appropriating 1516000 thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars wave reading thank you this is related to eagle river parks chugiak eagle river parks capital improvement projects anybody like to speak to us on this matter please come forward <coughs> hearing and seeing uh, no one the public hearing is closed madam chair on behalf of your constituents i'll move to approve why thank you sir <laughs> uh, a second would be nice huh? thank you it's second. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Drummond, can I pass this? Yes, go, go ahead, uh, Ms. Osiander. Um, I would like to move to amend this by reducing the dollar figure by $100,000. So the, uh, the revised figure would be $1,416,880. Second. Why? And, Madam Chair, before you proceed, may I ask a question? We, we have the dollar amount in the title. Are we allowed to use a different dollar amount less. in the body? Is as it lower? It's okay? Okay. As long as it's less. Yes. Somebody, you moved, Deb? I, I'm try. yes, I amended. We have a second. And I seconded you, but you need to. Okay. Any, any, you need to touch it. There we go. Okay. Ms. Osiander has moved. Mr. Coffey has seconded to reduce the dollar amount by $100,000. Any discussion? I'd like to know the why. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Osiander, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've conferred with Mr. Rada, who's here, if you have extensive questions, but generally he's told me that some of the projects, in particular the McDonald's Center repairs, is just not quite as expensive as originally had okay. been thought. And so we'll be able to not, we don't have to spend quite as much money as we anticipated for the good. project. Good news. Very good news. Okay. Any uh, further discussion? Any objection to the approval of this amendment? Seeing no objection, it is amended. Um, any further discussion on the motion as a whole? Any objection to passage of the motion? Seeing no objection, the motion passes as amended. Thank Ms. you very Osanda. much. Here you go. Thank you. All right, the next item before us is AR 189. This is a resolution of the municipality appropriating $258,238 from the Department of Housing and Urban Development as a supplemental grant funding for the Home Investment Partnerships Program. Would anyone like to speak to us on this matter? There's not enough votes. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing no objection, this matter is approved 10 to 0. The next item before us is uh, AR 197. This is a resolution adopting a subs the substantial amendment 5 to the 2008 Housing and Community Development Annual Action Plan. 
which constitutes an application of U.S. Department of Housing. Reading. Thank you. Anyone like to speak to us on this matter, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Is there discussion? Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, this matter is approved 10 to 0. This concludes our agenda. We have no special orders and no unfinished agenda items. This is a time for audience participation. If you'd like to speak to us on that, please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen of the assembly and Mr. Mayor, I would, my name is Tim Pearson. Uh, I would like for uh, Ms. Osiander, Mr. Birch, uh, Mr. Coffey, and uh, Mayor Sullivan just to sit there and look at me for three minutes and think about the 20,000 people in Anchorage who could be fired tomorrow simply because they're gay. Mr. Mayor, would you mind looking at me? Thank you. So you basically want no questions for three minutes because there are people in queue. Uh, I would be glad to, to have questions. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Selfrig, do you want to ask a question? Um, I appreciate you coming out tonight. I know we've been through months of this discussion, and I think that there is a great sense of disappointment for many people in this community. and. I can tell you uh, we have talked um, about overriding the veto. The votes aren't here to do it. So um, the veto won't be overridden. But I do think you raise the issue that there are lots of people in Anchorage who are gay, lesbian, and transgender uh, and bisexual who live everyday normal lives um, but live them with a veil over them. And so I appreciate that you took the time one more time to come down here and remind us of the work that we have before us in terms of equal justice in this community. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. I, uh, I work for the mayor and actually uh, fear that I possibly won't have a job tomorrow. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for your courage. Thank you. There's, there's nobody else in queue for a question. Well, it's not like me to sit down while the light's still green, but I'll, uh, I'll yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this body at this time? Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the First Amendment said, yep. Congress shall not make a law respecting an establishment of religion. Could you state your name first? Blon De Spaldingus Kenick. Okay, go ahead. Congress shall not make a law respecting an establishment of religion. Respecting means to highly honor. So it would read, if you use the definition of respecting, Congress shall not make a law highly honoring the establishment of religion, which is to come first. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us at this time? Hearing and seeing no one then, um, we're now at assembly comments. Are there any comments? Move to adjourn. That matters before us. Seeing no objection, we're adjourned. <laughs>